Chapter Fourteen of the Black Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance. Chapter Fourteen Stratagems and Spoils. Prepared as he had been for the shock, Kirkwood was able to pick himself up quickly, uninjured, Mulready's revolver in his grasp. On his feet, straddling Mulready's insentient body, he confronted Calendar and Stryker. The face of the latter was a sickly green, the gift of his fright. The former seemed coldly composed, already recovering from his surprise and bringing his wits to bear upon the new factor which had been so unceremoniously injected into the situation. Standing, but leaning heavily upon a hand that rested flat on the table, in the other he likewise held a revolver, which he had apparently drawn in self-defense, at the crisis of Mulready's frenzy. Its muzzle was deflected. He looked Kirkwood over with a cool gray eye, the color gradually returning to his fat, clean-shaven cheeks, replacing the pardonable pallor which had momentarily rested thereon. As for Kirkwood, he had covered the fat adventurer before he knew it. Stryker, who had been standing immediately in the rear of Calendar, immediately cowered and cringed to find himself in the line of fire. Of the three conscious men in the brigantine's cabin, Calendar was probably the least confused or excited. Stryker was palpably unmanned. Kirkwood was tingling with a sense of mastery, but collected and rapidly revolving the combinations for the reversed condition which had been brought about by Mulready's drunken folly. His elation was apparent in his shining, boyish eyes, as well as in the bright color that glowed in his cheeks. When he decided to speak, it was with rapid enunciation, but clearly and concisely. Calendar, he began, if a single shot is fired about this vessel, the river police will be buzzing around your ears in a brace of shakes. The fat adventurer nodded assent, his eyes contracting. Very well, continued Kirkwood brusquely. You must know that I have personally nothing to fear from the police. If arrested, I wouldn't be detained a day. On the other hand, you... Hand me that pistol, Calendar. But first, please... Look sharp, my man. If you don't... He left the ellipsis to be filled in by the corpulent blackguard's intelligence. The latter, gray eyes still intent on the younger man's face, wavered, plainly impressed, but still wondering. Quick! I'm not patient tonight. No longer was Calendar of two minds. In the face of Kirkwood's attitude, there was but one course to be followed, that of obedience. Calendar surrendered an untenable position as gracefully as could be wished. "'I guess you know what you mean by this,' he said, tendering the weapon as per instructions. "'I'm doggoned if I do. You'll allow a certain latitude in consideration of my relief. I can't say we were anticipating this, uh, heaven-sent visitation.' Accepting the revolver with his left hand, and settling his forefinger on the trigger, Kirkwood beamed with pure enjoyment. He found the deference of the older man, tempered though it was by indomitable swagger, refreshing in the extreme. "'A little appreciation isn't exactly out of place, come to think of it,' he commented, adding with an eye for the captain, "'Striker, you bold, bad butterfly, have you got a gun concealed about your unclean person?' The captain shook visibly with contrition. "'No, Mr. Kirkwood,' he managed to reply in a voice singularly lacking in his wanted bluster. "'Say, sir,' suggested Kirkwood. "'No, Mr. Kirkwood, sir,' amended Stryker eagerly. "'Now come round here and let's have a look at you. Please stay where you are, Calendar. Why, Captain, you're shivering from head to foot. Not ill, are you, you wag? Step over to the table there, Stryker, and turn out your pockets. Turn them inside out, and let's see what you carry in the way of offensive artillery. And, Stryker, don't be rash. Don't do anything you'd be sorry for afterwards. 
"'No fear of that,' mumbled the captain, meekly shambling toward the table, and in his anxiety to give no cause for unpleasantness, beginning to empty his pockets on the way. "'Don't forget the sir, Stryker. And, Stryker, if you happen to think of anything in the line of one of your merry quips or jests, don't strain yourself holding in. Get it right off your chest, and you'll feel better.' Kirkwood chuckled, in high conceit with himself watching calendar out of the corner of his eye but with his attention centered on the infinitely diverting spectacle afforded by stryker whose predacious hands were trembling violently as one by one they brought to light the articles of which he had despoiled his erstwhile victim come come stryker surely you can think of something witty surely you haven't exhausted the possibilities of that almanac joke couldn't you ring another variation on the lunatic wheeze? Don't hesitate out of consideration for me, Captain. I'm joke-proof. Perhaps you've noticed. Stryker turned upon him an expression at once ludicrous, piteous, and hateful. That's all, sir, he snarled, displaying his empty palms in token of his absolute tractability. Good enough. Now, right about face. Quick! Your back's prettier than your face, and, besides, I want to know whether your hip pockets are empty. I've heard it's the habit of you gentry to pack guns in your clothes. None? That's all right, then. Now, roost on the transom, over there, in the corner, Stryker, and don't move. Don't let me hear a word from you. Understand? Submissively, the captain retired to the indicated spot. Kirkwood turned to Calendar of whose attitude, however, he had not been for an instant unmindful. "'Won't you sit down, Mr. Callender?' he suggested pleasantly. "'Forgive me for keeping you waiting.' For his own part, as the adventurer had dropped passively into his chair, Kirkwood stepped over Mulready and advanced to the middle of the cabin, at the same time thrusting Callender's revolver into his own coat-pocket. The other— Mulready's, he nursed significantly with both hands, while he stood temporarily quiet, surveying the fleshy face of the prime factor in the intrigue. A quaint, grim smile played about the American's lips, a smile a little contemptuous, more than a little inscrutable. In its light, Calendar grew restive and lost something of his assurance. His feet shifted uneasily beneath the table, and his dark eyes wavered, evading Kirkwood's. At length, he seemed to find the suspense unendurable. "'Well,' he demanded testily, "'what do you want of me?' "'I was just wondering at you, Calendar. In the last few days you've given me enough cause to wonder, as you'll admit.' The adventurer plucked up spirit, deluded by Kirkwood's pacific tone. "'I wonder at you, Mr. Kirkwood,' he retorted. "'It was good of you to save my life, and—' I'm not so sure of that. Perhaps it had been more humane. Calendar owned the touch with a wry grimace. But I'm damned if I understand the high-handed attitude of yours, he concluded heatedly. Don't you? Kirkwood's humor became less apparent, the smile sobering. You will, he told the man, adding abruptly, Calendar, where's your daughter? The restless eyes sought the companionway. Dorothy, the man lied spontaneously, without tremor, is with friends in England. Why? Did you want to see her? I rather expected to. Well, I thought it best to leave her home, after all. I'm glad to hear she's in safe hands, commented Kirkwood. The adventurer's glance analyzed his face. Ah, he said slowly, I see. You followed me on Dorothy's account, Mr. Kirkwood? Partly, partly on my own. Let me put it to you fairly. When you forced yourself upon me back there in London, you offered me some sort of employment. When I rejected it, you used me to your advantage for the furtherance of your purposes, which I confess I don't understand, and made me miss my steamer. Naturally, when I found myself penniless and friendless in a strange country, I thought again of your offer, and tried to find you to accept it. Despite the fact that you're an honest man, Kirkwood? The fat lips twitched with premature enjoyment. I'm a desperate man tonight, 
whatever I may have been yesterday. The young man's tone was both earnest and convincing. I think I've shown that by my pertinacity in hunting you down. Well, yes. Calendar's thick fingers caressed his lips, tried to hide the dawning smile. Is that offer still open? His nonchalance completely restored by the very naivete of the proposition, Calendar laughed openly and with a trace of irony. The episode seemed to be turning out better than he had anticipated. Gently, his mottled fat fingers played about his mouth and chins as he looked Kirkwood up and down. I'm sorry, he replied, that it isn't, now. You're too late, Kirkwood. I've made other arrangements. Too bad, Kirkwood's eyes narrowed. You force me to harsher measures, Calendar. Genuinely diverted, the adventurer laughed a second time, tipping back in his chair, his huge frame shaking with ponderous enjoyment. Don't do anything you'd be sorry for, he parroted, sarcastical, the young man's recent admonition to the captain. No fear, Calendar. I'm just going to use my advantage, which you don't dispute. The pistol described an eloquent circle, gleaming in the lamplight, to levy on you a little legitimate blackmail. Don't be alarmed. I shan't hit you any harder than I have to. What? stammered Calendar, astonished. What in hell are you driving at? Recompense for my time and trouble. You've cost me a pretty penny, first and last, with your nasty little conspiracy, whatever it's all about. Now, needing the money, I propose getting some of it back. I shan't precisely rob you, but this is a hold-up, all right, Stryker. Reproachfully, I don't see my pearl pin. I got it ear, responded the sailor hastily, fumbling with his tie. Give it me, then. Kirkwood held out his hand and received the trinket. Then, moving over to the table, the young man, while abating nothing of his watchfulness, sorted out his belongings from the mass of odds and ends Stryker had disgorged. The tale of them was complete. The captain had obeyed him faithfully. Kirkwood looked up, pleased. Now see here, Calendar, this collection of truck that I was robbed of by this resurrected Joe Miller here cost me upwards of a hundred and fifty. I'm going to sell it to you at a bargain, say fifty dollars, two hundred and fifty francs. The juice you are, Calendar's eyes opened wide, partly in admiration. Do you realize that this is next door to highway robbery, my young friend? High seas piracy, if you prefer, assented Kirkwood, with entire equanimity. I'm going to have the money, and you're going to give it up. The transaction by any name would smell no sweeter, Calendar. Come, fork over. And if I refuse? I wouldn't refuse if I were you. Why not? The consequences would be too painful. You mean you'd puncture me with that gun? Not unless you attack or attempt to follow me. I mean to say that the Belgian police are notoriously a most efficient body, and that I'll make it my duty and pleasure to introduce them to you, if you refuse. But you won't, Kirkwood added soothingly. Will you, Calendar? No, the adventurer had become suddenly thoughtful. No, I won't. Glad to oblige you. He tilted his chair still farther back, straightening out his elephantine legs, inserted one fat hand into his trouser pocket, and with some difficulty extracted a combined billfold and coin purse, at once heavy with gold and bulky with notes. Moistening thumb and forefinger, "'How'll you have it?' he inquired with a lift of his cunning eyes, and when Kirkwood had advised him, slowly counted out four fifty-franc notes, placed them near the edge of the table, and weighted them with five ten-franc pieces. And that all? he asked, replacing the pocket-book. That will be about all. I leave you presently to your unholy devices, you and that gay dog over there. The captain squirmed, reddening. Just by way of precaution, however, I'll ask you to wait in here till I'm off. Kirkwood stepped backwards to the door of the captain's room, opened it, and removed the key from the inside. Please take Mulready in with you, he continued. By the time you get out, I'll be clear of Antwerp. Please don't think of refusing me. 
I really mean it. The latter clause came sharply as Calendar seemed to hesitate, his weary, wary eyes glimmering with doubt. Kirkwood, watching him as a cat her prey, intercepted a lightning-swift sidelong glance that shifted from his face to the port lockers forward but the fat adventurer was evidently to a considerable degree deluded by the very childlike simplicity of kirkwood's attitude if the possibility that his altercation with mulready had been overheard crossed his mind calendar had little choice other than to accept the chance either way he moved the risk was great if he refused to be locked in the captain's room there was the danger of the police to which kirkwood had convincingly drawn attention if he accepted the temporary imprisonment he took a risk with the gladstone bag on the other hand he had estimated kirkwood's honesty as thoroughgoing from their first interview he had appraised him as a gentleman and a man of honor and he did not believe the young man knew after all perplexed at length he chose the smoother way and with an indulgent lifting of eyebrows and fat shoulders rose and waddled over to mulready Oh, all right, he conceded, with deep toleration in his tone, for the idiosyncrasies of youth. It's all the same to me, Bo, he laughed a nervous laugh. Come along, and lend us a hand, Stryker. The latter glanced timidly at Kirkwood, his eyes pleading for leave to move, which Kirkwood accorded with an imperative nod and a fine flourish of the revolver. Promptly, the captain sprang to Calendar's assistance, and between the two of them, the one taking Mulready's head, the other his feet, they lugged him quickly into the stuffy little stateroom. Kirkwood, watching and following to the threshold, inserted the key. "'One word more,' he counseled, a hand on the knob. "'Don't forget I've warned you what'll happen if you try to break even with me.' "'Never fear, little one.' Calendar's laugh was nervously cheerful. The Lord knows you're welcome. Thank you most to death, responded Kirkwood politely. Good-bye, and good-bye to you, Stryker. Glad to have humored your desire to meet me soon again. Kirkwood, turning the key in the lock, withdrew it and dropped it on the cabin table. At the same time he swept into his pocket the money he had extorted of Calendar. Then he paused an instant listening. From the captain's room came a sound of murmurs and scuffling. He debated what they were about in there. But time pressed. Not improbably, they were crowding for place at the keyhole, he reflected, as he crossed to the port locker forward. He had it slid up in a twinkling, and in another had lifted out the well-remembered black gladstone bag. This seems to have been his first compound larceny as if stimulated by some such reflection he sprang for the companionway dropping the lid of the locker with a bang which must have been excruciatingly edifying to the men in the captain's room whatever their emotions the bang was mocked by a mighty kick shaking the door which kirkwood reflected opened outward and was held only by the frailest kind of a lock it would not hold long Spurred onward by a storm of curses, Stryker's voice chanting infuriated cacophony with calendars, Kirkwood leapt up the companionway even as the second tremendous kick threatened to shatter the panels. Heart in mouth, a chill shiver of guilt running up and down his spine, he gained the deck, cast loose the painter, drew in his rowboat, and dropped over the side then the gladstone bag nestling between his feet sat down and bent to the oars and doubts assailed him pressing close upon the ebb of his excitement doubts and fears innumerable there was no longer a distinction to be drawn between himself and calendar no more could he esteem himself a better and more honest man than that accomplished swindler he was not advised as to the belgian code but english law he understood, made no allowance for the good intent of those caught in possession of stolen property, though he was acting with the most honorable motives in the world, the law, if he came within its cognizance, would undoubtedly place him on Calendar's plane and judge him by the same standard. To all intents and purposes, he was a thief, and thief he would remain until the Gladstone bag, with its contents, should be restored to its rightful owner. 
Voluntarily, then, he had stepped from the ranks of the hunters to those of the hunted. He now feared police interference as abjectly as did Calendar and his set of rogues, and Kirkwood felt wholly warranted in assuming that the adventurer, with his keen intelligence, would not handicap himself by ignoring this point. Indeed, if he were to be judged by what Kirkwood had inferred of his character, Calendar would let nothing whatever hinder him, neither fear of bodily hurt nor danger of apprehension at the hands of the police, from making a determined and savage play to regain possession of his booty. Well, Kirkwood set his mouth savagely, Calendar should have a run for his money. For the present, he could compliment himself with the knowledge that he had outwitted the rogues, had lifted the jewels and probably two-thirds of their armament. He had also the start, the knowledge of their criminal guilt and intent, and his own plans to comfort him. As for the latter, he did not believe that Calendar would immediately fathom them. So he took heart of grace and tugged at the oars with a will, pulling directly for the city and permitting the current to drift him downstream at its pleasure. There could be no more inexcusable folly than to return to the Casteen landing and, possibly, the arms of the despoiled boat owner. At first he could hear crash after splintering crash sounding dully muffled from the cabin of the Alethea, a veritable devil's tattoo beaten out by the feet of the prisoners. Evidently the fastening was serving him better than he had dared hope but as the black rushing waters widened between boat and brigantine the clamor aboard the latter subsided indicating that calendar and stryker had broken out or been released by the crew in ignorance as to whether he were seen or being pursued kirkwood pulled on winning in under the shadow of the quays and permitting the boat to drift down to a lonely landing on the edge of the dockyard quarter of antwerp here alighting he made the boat fast and, soothing his conscience with the surmise that its owner would find it there in the morning, strode swiftly over to the train line that runs along the embankment, swung aboard an adventitious car, and broke his first ten-franc piece in order to pay his fare. The car made a leisurely progress up past the old Steen Castle and the K Landing. Kirkwood, sitting quietly, the Gladstone bag under his hand, a searching gaze sweeping the waterside, no sign of the adventurers rewarded him, but it was now all chance, all hazard. He had no more heart for confidence. They passed the Hôtel du Commerce. Kirkwood stared up at its windows, wondering. A little further on, a disengaged fiacre, its driver alert for possible fares, turned a corner into the esplanade. At sight of it, Kirkwood, inspired, hopped nimbly off the tram-car and signaled the cabby. The latter pulled up, and Kirkwood started to charge him with instructions, something which he did haltingly, hampered by a slight haziness of purpose. While thus engaged, and at rest in the stark glare of the street lamps, with no chance of concealing himself, he was aware of a rising tumult in the direction of the landing, and, glancing round, discovered a number of people running toward him. With no time to wonder whether or no he was really the object of the hue and cry, he tossed the driver three silver francs. Gare Centrale, he cried, and drive like the devil. Driving into the fiacre, he shut the door and stuck his head out of the window, taking observations. A ragged fringe of silly rabble was bearing down upon them, with one or two gendarmes in the forefront, and a giant, who might or might not be Stryker, a close second. Furthermore, another cab seemed to have been requisitioned for the chase. His heart misgave him momentarily, but his driver had taken him at his word and generosity, and in a breath the fiacre had turned the corner on two wheels, and the glittering reaches of the embankment, drive and promenade, were blotted out, as if smudged with lamp-black, by the obscurity of a narrow and tortuous side-street. He drew in his head the better to preserve his brains against further emergencies. After a block or two, Kirkwood picked up the Gladstone bag, gently opened the door, and put a foot on the step, pausing to look back. The other cab was pelting after him with all the enthusiasm of a hound on a fresh trail. He reflected that this mad progress through the thoroughfares of a civilized city would not long endure without police intervention. So he waited, 
watching his opportunity. The fiacre hurtled onward, the driver leaning forward from his box to urge the horse with lash of whip and tongue, entirely unconscious of his fair's intentions. Between two streets, the mouth of a narrow and darksome byway flashed into view. Kirkwood threw wide the door and leaped, trusting to the night to hide a stratagem, to luck to save his limbs. Neither failed him. In a twinkling, he was on all fours in the mouth of the alley and as he picked himself up the second fiacre passed calendar himself poking a round bald pole out of the window to incite his driver's cupidity with promises of redoubled fare kirkwood mopped his dripping forehead and whistled low with dismay it seemed that from that instant on it was to be a vendetta with a vengeance calendar as he had foreseen was stopping at nothing at a dog-trot he sped down the alley to the next street on which he turned back more sedately toward the river debouching on the esplanade just one block from the hotel du commerce as he swung past the serried tables of a cafe whatever fears he had harbored were banished by the discovery that the excitement occasioned by the chase had already subsided beneath the garish awnings the crowd was laughing and chattering eating and sipping its bock with complete unconcern heedless altogether of the haggard and shabby young man carrying a black handbag with a black shade of care for company and a blacker threat of disaster dogging his footsteps without attracting any attention whatever indeed he mingled with the strolling crowds making his way toward the hotel du commerce yet he was not at all at ease his uneasy conscience invested the gladstone bag with a magnetic attraction for the public eye to carry it unconcealed in his hand furnished him with a sensation as disturbing as though its worn black sides had been stenciled stolen in letters of flame he felt it rendered him a cynosure of public interest an object of suspicion to the wide cold world that the gaze which lit upon the bag traveled to his face only to espy thereon the brand of guilt for ease of mind presently he turned into a convenient shop and spent ten invaluable francs for a hand satchel big enough to hold the gladstone bag with more courage now that he had the hateful thing under cover he found and entered the hotel du commerce in the little closet which served for an office over a desk visibly groaning with the weight of an enormous and grimy registry book a sleepy fat bland and good-natured woman of the belgian bourgeoisie presided a benign and drowsy divinity of even-tempered courtesy to his misleading inquiry for monsieur calendar she returned a cheerful permission to seek that gentleman for himself three flights monsieur in the front sweet seventeen it is monsieur does not mind walking up she inquired monsieur did not in the least though by no strain of the imagination could it be truthfully said that he walked up those steep and redolent stairways of the hotel du commerce d'anvers more literally he flew with winged feet spurning each third padded step with a force that raised a tiny cloud of fine white dust from the carpeting breathless at last he paused at the top of the third flight. His heart was hammering, his pulses drumming like wild things. There was a queer constriction in his throat, a fire of hope in his heart alternating with the ice of doubt. Suppose she were not there? What if he were mistaken? What if he had misunderstood? What if Mulready and Calendar had referred to another lodging house? Pausing, he gripped the balustrade fiercely forcing his self-control, forcing himself to reflect that the girl, presuming for the sake of argument he were presently to find her, could not be expected to understand how ardently he had discounted this moment of meeting, or how strangely it affected him. Indeed, he himself was more than a little disturbed by the latter phenomenon, though he was no longer blind to its cause. But he was not to let her see the evidences of his agitation, lest she be frightened slowly schooling himself to assume a mask of eluding self-possession and composure he passed down the corridor to the door whose panel wore the painted legend seventeen and there knocked believing that he overheard from within a sudden startled exclamation he smiled patiently tolerant of her surprise 
burning with impatience, as with a fever, he endured a long minute's wait. Misgivings were prompting him to knock again, and summon her by name, when he heard footfalls on the other side of the door, followed by a click of the lock. The door was opened grudgingly a bare six inches. Of the alarmed expression in the eyes that stared into his, he took no account. His face lengthened a little as he stood there, dumb, panting, staring, and his heart sank, down, deep down, into a gulf of disappointment, weighted sorely with chagrin. Then, of the two, the first to recover countenance, he doffed his cap and bowed. "'Good evening, Mrs. Hallam,' he said, with a rueful smile. End of chapter 14 Recording by William Tomko Chapter 15 of The Black Bag This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance Chapter 15 Refugees now, if Kirkwood's emotion was poignant, Mrs. Hallam's astonishment paralleled, and her belief transcended it. In order to understand this, it must be remembered that while Mr. Kirkwood was aware of the lady's presence in Antwerp, on her part she had known nothing of him since he had so ungallantly fled her company in sheerness. She seemed to anticipate that either Calendar or one of his fellows would be discovered at the door to have surmised it without any excessive degree of pleasure. Only briefly, she hesitated. While her surprise swayed her, then, with a hardening of the eyes and a curt little nod, I'm sorry, she said with decision, but I am busy and can't see you now, Mr. Kirkwood, and attempted to shut the door in his face. Deftly, Kirkwood forestalled her intention by inserting both a foot and a corner of the newly purchased handbag between the door and the jam. He had dared too greatly to be thus dismissed. "'Pardon me,' he countered, unabashed, "'but I wish to speak with Miss Calendar. "'Dorothy,' returned the lady with spirit, "'is engaged.' She compressed her lips, knitted her brows, and with disconcerting suddenness thrust one knee against the obstructing handbag. Kirkwood, happily, anticipated the movement just in time to reinforce the bag with his own knee. It remained in place, the door standing open. The woman flushed angrily, their glances crossed, her eyes flashing with indignation. But Kirkwood's held them with a level and unyielding stare. "'I intend,' he told her quietly, "'to see Miss Calendar. It's useless you're trying to hinder me.' We may as well understand each other, madam, and I'll tell you now that if you wish to avoid a scene— Dorothy, the woman called over her shoulder, ring for the porter. By all means, assented Kirkwood agreeably. I'll send him for a gendarme. You insolent puppy. Madam, your wit disarms me. What is the matter, Mrs. Hallam? interrupted a voice from the other side of the door. Who is it? Miss Callender cried Kirkwood hastily, raising his voice. "'Mr. Kirkwood!' the reply came on the instant. She knew his voice. "'Please, Mrs. Hallam, I will see Mr. Kirkwood.' "'You have no time to waste with him, Dorothy,' said the woman coldly. "'I must insist, but you don't seem to understand. "'It is Mr. Kirkwood,' argued the girl, as if he were ample excuse for any imprudence." Kirkwood's scant store of patience was by this time rapidly becoming exhausted. "'I should advise you not to interfere any further, Mrs. Hallam,' he told her in a tone low, but charged with meaning. How much did he know? She eyed him an instant longer, in sullen suspicion, then swung open the door, yielding with what grace she could. "'Won't you come in, Mr. Kirkwood?' she inquired with acidulated courtesy. "'If you press me,' he returned winningly. How can I refuse? You are too good. His impertinence disconcerted even himself. He wondered that she did not slap him as he passed her, entering the room. 
and felt that he deserved it, despite her attitude. But such thoughts could not long trouble one whose eyes were enchanted by the sight of Dorothy. Confronting him in the middle of the dingy room, her hands, bristling dangerously with hat-pins, busy with the adjustment of a small gray toque atop the wonder that was her hair. So vivacious and charming she seemed, so spirited and bright her welcoming smile. So foreign was she altogether to the picture of her, worn and distraught, that he had mentally conjured up, that he stopped in an extreme of disconcertion and dropped the handbag, smiling sheepishly enough under her ready laugh, mirth irresistibly incited by the plainly read play of expression on his mobile countenance. "'You must forgive the unconventionally, Mr. Kirkwood,' she apologized, needlessly enough, but to cover his embarrassment. "'I am on the point of going out with Mrs. Hallam, and, of course, you are the last person on earth I expected to meet here.' "'It's good to see you, Miss Calendar,' he said simply, remarking with much satisfaction that her trim walking costume bore witness to her statement that she was prepared for the street. The girl glanced into a mirror— patted the small, bewitching hat an infinitesimal fraction of an inch to one side, and turned to him again, her hands free. One of them, small but cordial, rested in his grasp for an instant all too brief, the while he gazed earnestly into her face, noting with concern what the first glance had not shown him, the almost imperceptible shadows beneath her eyes and cheekbones, pathetic records of the hours the girl had spent, since last he had seen her, in company with his own grim, familiar care. Not a little of care and distress of mind had seasoned her portion in those two weary days. He saw and knew it, and his throat tightened inexplicably, again as it had out there in the corridor. Possibly the change in her had passed unchallenged by any eyes other than his, but even in the little time that he had spent in her society, the image of her had become fixed so indelibly on his memory that he could not now be deceived. She was changed, a little, but changed. She had suffered and was suffering, and, forced by suffering, her nascent womanhood was stirring in the bud. The child that he had met in London, in Antwerp, he found grown to woman stature and slowly coming to comprehension of the nature of the change in herself the wonder of it glowing softly in her eyes. The clear understanding of mankind that is an appanage of woman's estate was now added to the intuitions of a girl's untroubled heart. She could not be blind to the mute adoration of his gaze, nor could she resent it. Beneath it she colored and lowered her lashes. "'I was about to go out,' she repeated in confusion. "'I—it's pleasant to see you, too.' "'Thank you.' he stammered ineptly. I, I, if Mr. Kirkwood will excuse us, Dorothy, Mrs. Hallam's sharp tones struck in discordantly, we shall be glad to see him when we return to London. I am infinitely complimented, Mrs. Hallam, Kirkwood assured her, and of the girl quickly. You're going back home? he asked. She nodded with a faint, puzzled smile that included the woman. After a little, not immediately, Mrs. Hallam is so kind. Pardon me, he interrupted, but tell me one thing. Please, have you anyone in England to whom you can go without invitation and be welcomed and cared for? Any friends or relations? Dorothy will be with me, Mrs. Hallam answered for her, with cold defiance. Deliberately insolent, Kirkwood turned his back to the woman. Miss Callender, will you answer my question for yourself? he asked the girl pointedly. "'Why, yes, several friends, none in London, but—' "'Dorothy!' "'One moment, Mrs. Hallam,' Kirkwood flung crisply over his shoulder. "'I'm going to ask you something rather odd, Miss Calendar. he continued, seeking the girl's eyes. "'I hope I—' "'Dorothy, I—' "'If you please, Mrs. Hallam,' suggested the girl, with just the right shade of independence, "'I wish to listen to Mr. Kirkwood.' He has been very kind to me, and has every right. She turned to him again, leaving the woman breathless and speechless with anger. You told me once, Kirkwood continued quickly, and he felt brazenly, that you considered me kind, thoughtful, and considerate. 
You know me no better today than you did then, but I want to beg you to trust me a little. Can you trust yourself to my protection until we reach your friends in England? Why, I— The girl faltered, taken by surprise. Mr. Kirkwood, cried Mrs. Hallam, angrily, finding her voice. Kirkwood turned to meet her onslaught with a mean grave, determined, unflinching. Please do not interfere, madam, he said quietly. You are impertinent, sir. Dorothy, I forbid you to listen to this person. The girl flushed, lifting her chin a trifle. Forbid? she repeated wonderingly. Kirkwood was quick to take advantage of her resentment. Mrs. Hallam is not fitted to advise you, he insisted, nor can she control your actions. It must already have occurred to you that you're rather out of place in the present circumstances. The men who have brought you hither, I believe you already see through, to some extent. Forgive my speaking plainly, but that is why you have accepted Mrs. Hallam's offer of protection. Will you take my word for it, when I tell you she has not your right interests at heart, but the reverse? I happen to know, Miss Callender, and I— How dare you, sir! Flaming with rage, Mrs. Hallam put herself bodily between them, confronting Kirkwood in white-lipped desperation, her small, gloved hands clenched and quivering at her sides, her green eyes dangerous. But Kirkwood could silence her, and he did. Do you wish me to speak frankly, madam? Do you wish me to tell what I know, and all I know, with rising emphasis, of your social status and your relations with Calendar and Mulready? I promise you that if you wish it, or force me to it, but he had need to say nothing further. The woman's eyes wavered before his, and a little sob of terror forced itself between her shut teeth. Kirkwood smiled grimly, with a face of brass impenetrable, inflexible, and suddenly she turned from him with indifferent bravado. As Mr. Kirkwood says, Dorothy, she said in her high metallic voice, I have no authority over you. But if you're silly enough to consider for a moment this fellow's insulting suggestion, if you're fool enough to go with him, unchaperoned through Europe, and imperil your— Mrs. Hallam, Kirkwood cut her short with a menacing tone. Why, then, I wash my hands of you, concluded the woman defiantly. Make your choice, my child, she added with a meaning laugh, and moved away, humming a snatch from a French chanson, which brought the hot blood to Kirkwood's face. But the girl did not understand, and he was glad of that. You may judge between us, he appealed to her directly once more. I can only offer you my word of honor as an American gentleman that you shall be landed in England safe and sound by the first available steamer. There is no need to say more, Mr. Kirkwood, Dorothy informed him quietly. I have already decided. I think I begin to understand some things clearly now. If you're ready, we will go. From the window, where she stood, holding the curtains back and staring out, Mrs. Hallam turned with a curling lip. The honor of an American gentleman, she quoted with a stinging sneer. I'm sure I wish you comfort of it, child. We must make haste, Miss Callender, said Kirkwood, ignoring the implication. Have you a traveling bag? She silently indicated a small valise, closed and strapped on a table by the bed, and immediately passed out into the hall. Kirkwood took the case containing the Gladstone bag in one hand, the girl's valise in the other, and followed. As he turned the head of the stairs, he looked back. Mrs. Hallam was still at the window, her back turned. From her very passiveness, he received an impression of something ominous and forbidding. If she had lost a trick or two of the game she played, she still held cards, was not at the end of her resources. She stuck in his imagination for many an hour as a force to be reckoned with. For the present, he understood that she was waiting to apprise Calendar and Mulready of their flight. With the more haste, then, he followed Dorothy down the three flights, through the tiny office, where Madame sat sound asleep at her overburdened desk, and out. Opposite the door, they were fortunate enough to find a fiacre drawn up in waiting at the curb. Kirkwood opened the door for the girl to enter. Gare du Sud, he directed the driver. Drive your fastest. Double fare for quick time. The driver awoke with a start from profound reverie, 
looked Kirkwood over, and bowed with gesticulative palms. "'Monsieur, I am desolated but engaged,' he protested. "'Precisely,' Kirkwood deposited the two bags on the forward seat of the conveyance, and stood back to convince the man. "'Precisely,' said he, undismayed. "'The lady who engaged you is remaining for a time. I will settle her bill.' "'Very well, monsieur.' The driver disclaimed responsibility, and accepted the favor of the gods with a speaking shrug. Monsieur said the guerre du sud, en voiture. Kirkwood jumped in and shut the door. The vehicle drew slowly away from the curb, then, with gratifying speed, hammered upstream to the embankment. Bending forward, elbows on knees, Kirkwood watched the sidewalks narrowly, partly to cover the girl's constraint due to Mrs. Hallam's attitude, partly on the lookout for Calendar and his confederates. In a few moments they passed a public clock. "'We've missed the flushing boat,' he announced. "'I'm making a try for the Hoke Van Holland line. We may possibly make it. I know that it leaves by the Sud Quai, and that's all I do know,' he concluded with an apologetic laugh. "'And if we miss that?' asked the girl, breaking silence for the first time since they had left the hotel. We'll take the first train out of Antwerp. Where to? Wherever the first train goes, Miss Calendar. The main point is to get away tonight. That we must do, no matter where we land or how we get there. Tomorrow we can plan with more certainty. Yes, her assent was more a sigh than a word. The cab, dashing down the Rue Leopold de Whale, swung into the Place du Sud before the station. Kirkwood, acutely watchful, suddenly thrust head and shoulders out of his window, fortunately it was the one away from the depot, and called up to the driver. Don't stop. Guerre centrale now, and treble fare. Oui, monsieur. Allons. The whip cracked, and the horse swerved sharply around the corner into the avenue du Sud. The young man, with a hushed exclamation, turned in his seat, lifting the flap over the little peephole in the back of the carriage. He had not been mistaken. Calendar was standing in front of the station, and it was plain to be seen, from his pose, that the madly careering fiacre interested him more than slightly. Irresolute, perturbed, the man took a step or two after it, changed his mind, and returned to his post of observation. Kirkwood dropped the flap and turned back to find the girl's wide eyes searching his face. He said nothing. "'What was that?' she asked, after a patient moment. "'Your father, Miss Calendar,' he returned uncomfortably. There fell a short pause. Then, "'Why, will you tell me, is it necessary to run away from my father, Mr. Kirkwood?' she demanded with a moving little break in her voice. Kirkwood hesitated. It were unfeeling to tell her why, yet it was essential that she should know, however painful the knowledge might prove to her. And she was insistent. He might not dodge the issue." "'Why?' she repeated as he paused. "'I wish you would impress me for an answer just now, Miss Calendar. "'Don't you think I had better know?' Instinctively he inclined his head in assent. "'Then why—' Kirkwood bent forward and patted the flank of the satchel that held the Gladstone bag. "'What does that mean, Mr. Kirkwood?' "'That I have the jewels,' he told her tersely, looking straight ahead." At his shoulder he heard a low gasp of amazement and incredulity commingled. "'But how did you get them? My father deposited them in the bank this morning. He must have taken them out again. I got them on board the Alethea, where your father was conferring with Mulready and Captain Stryker. "'The Alethea? Yes. You took them from those men? You? But didn't my father—' I had to persuade him, said Kirkwood, simply. But there were three of them against you. Mulready wasn't, uh, feeling very well, and Stryker's a coward. They gave me no trouble. I locked them in Stryker's room, lifted the bag of jewels, and came away. I ought to tell you that they were discussing the advisability of sailing away without you, leaving you here, friendless and without means. That's why I considered it my duty to take a hand. I don't like to tell you this so brutally, but you ought to know, and I can't see how to tone it down," he concluded awkwardly. I understand. But for some moments she did not speak. 
he avoided looking at her. The fiacre, rolling at top speed but smoothly on the broad avenues that encircled the ancient city, turned into the Avenue de Kaiser, bringing into sight the Gare Centrale. "'You don't know,' began the girl without warning, in a voice gusty with sobs. "'Steady on,' said Kirkwood gently. "'I do know. But don't let's talk about it now.' We'll be at the station in a minute, and I'll get out and see what's to be done about a train, if neither Mulready or Stryker are about. You stay in the carriage. No, he changed his mind suddenly. I'll not risk losing you again. It's a risk we'll have to run in company. Please, she agreed brokenly. The fiacre slowed up and stopped. Are you all right, Miss Calendar? Kirkwood asked. The girl sat up, lifting her head proudly. I am quite ready, she said, steadying her voice. Kirkwood reconnoitered through the window while the driver was descending. Gare Centrale, monsieur, he said, opening the door. No one in sight, Kirkwood told the girl. Come, please. He got out and gave her his hand, then paid the driver, picked up the two bags, and hurried with Dorothy into the station to find in waiting a string of cars into which people were moving at leisurely rate. His inquiries at the ticket window developed the fact that it was the 2226 for Brussels, the last train leaving the Gare Centrale that night, and due to start in ten minutes. The information settled their plans for once and all. Kirkwood promptly secured through tickets, also purchasing reserve supplementary tickets, which entitled them to the use of those modern corridor coaches which take the place of first-class compartments on the Belgian state railways. It's a pleasure, said Kirkwood lightly, as he followed the girl into one of these, to find oneself in a common-sense sort of a train again. Feels like home. He put their luggage in one of the racks and sat down beside her, chattering with simulated cheerfulness in a vain endeavor to lighten her evident depression of spirits. I always feel like a traveling anachronism in one of your English trains, he said. You can't appreciate. The girl smiled bravely. "'And after Brussels?' she inquired. "'The first train for the coast,' he said promptly. "'Dover, Ostend, Boulogne. "'Whichever proves handiest, no matter which, "'so long as it gets us on English soil without undue delay.' "'She said, yes, abstractedly, "'resting an elbow on the window-sill "'and her chin in her palm "'to stare with serious, sweet brown eyes "'out into the arc-smitten night "'that hung beneath the echoing roof.' Kirkwood fidgeted, in despite of the constraint he placed himself under, to be still and not disturb her needlessly. Impatience and apprehension of misfortune obsessed his mental processes in equal degree. The ten minutes seemed interminable that elapsed ere the grinding couplings advertised the imminence of their start. The guards began to bawl, the doors to slam, belated travelers to dash madly for the coaches. The train gave a preliminary lurch ere settling down to its league-long inland dash. Kirkwood, in a fever of hope and an ague of fear, saw a man sprint furiously across the platform and throw himself on the forward steps of their coach on the very instant of the start. Presently he entered by the forward door and walked slowly through, narrowly inspecting the various passengers. As he approached the seats occupied by Kirkwood and Dorothy Callender, his eyes encountered the young man's, and he leered evilly. Kirkwood met the look with one that was like a kick, and the fellow passed with some haste into the car behind. "'Who is that?' demanded the girl, without moving her head. "'How did you know?' he asked, astonished. "'You didn't look. I saw your knuckles whiten beneath the skin. Who was it?' Hobbs, he acknowledged bitterly, the mate of the Alethea. I know, and you think... Yes, he must have been ashore when I was on board the brigantine. He certainly wasn't in the cabin. Evidently they hunted him up, or ran across him, and pressed him into service. You see, they're watching every outlet. But we'll win through. Never fear. End of chapter 15 Recording by William Tomko Chapter 16, Part 1 of The Black Bag This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance Chapter 16, Part 1 Travels with a Chaperone The train, escaping the outskirts of the city, remarked the event with an exultant shriek, then settled down, droning steadily, to night-devouring flight. In the corridor car, the few passengers disposed themselves to drowse away the coming hour. The short hour's ride that, in these piping days of frantic travelling, separates Antwerp from the capital city of Belgium. A guard, slamming gustily in through the front door, reeled unsteadily down the aisle. Kirkwood, rousing from a profound reverie, detained him with a gesture and began to interrogate him in French. When he departed presently, it transpired that the girl was unacquainted with that tongue. "'I didn't understand, you know,' she told him with a slow, shy smile. "'I was merely questioning him about the trains from Brussels to-night. "'We daren't stop, you see. We must go on. "'Keep Hobbs on the jump and lose him if possible. "'That's where our advantage lies, in having only Hobbs to deal with. "'He's not particularly intellectual, and we've two heads to his one, besides.' If we can prevent him from guessing our destination and wiring back to Antwerp, we may win away. You understand? Perfectly, she said, brightening. And what do you purpose doing now? I can't tell yet. The guard's gone to get me some information about the night trains on other lines. In the meantime, don't fret about Hobbs. I'll answer for Hobbs. I shan't be worried, she said simply, with you here. Whatever answer he would have made, he was obliged to postpone because of the return of the guard, with a handful of timetables, and, when rewarded with a modest gratuity, the man had gone his way, and Kirkwood turned again to the girl. She had withdrawn her attention for the time. Unconscious of his bold regard, she was dreaming, her thoughts at loose ends, her eyes studying the incalculable depths of blue-black night that swirled and eddied beyond the window glass. The most shadowy of smiles touched her lips. The faintest shade of deepened colour rested on her cheeks. She was thinking of him. As long as he dared, the young man, his heart in his own eyes, watched her greedily, taking a miser's joy of her youthful beauty, striving with all his soul to analyse the enigma of that most inscrutable smile. It baffled him. He could not say of what she thought, and told himself bitterly that it was not for him, a pauper, to presume a place in her meditations. He must not forget his circumstances, nor let her tolerance render him oblivious to his place, which must be a servant's, not a lover's. The better to convince himself of this, he plunged desperately into a forlorn attempt to make head or tail of Belgian railway schedule. Complicated as these of necessity are, by the alternation from normal time notation to the abnormal system sanctioned by the government, and vice versa, with every train that crosses a boundary line of the state. So preoccupied did he become in this pursuit, that he was subconsciously impressed that the girl had spoken twice, ere he could detach his interest from the exasperatingly inconclusive and incoherent cohorts of ranked figures. "'Can't you find out anything?' Dorothy was asking. Precious little, he grumbled. I'd give my head for a Bradshaw, only it wouldn't be a fair exchange. There seems to be an express for Bruges, leaving the Gare du Nord, Brussels, at fifty-five minutes after twenty-three o'clock. And if I'm not mistaken, that's the latest train out of Brussels, and the earliest we can catch. If we can catch it. I've never been in Brussels and heaven only knows how long it would take us to cab it from the Gare de Midi to the Nord. In this statement, however, Mr Kirkwood was fortunately mistaken. Not only heaven, it appeared, had cognizance of the distance between the two stations. While Kirkwood was still debating the question with pessimistic tendencies, the friendly guard had occasion to pass through the coach, and, being tapped, yielded the desired information with entire tractability. It would be a cab ride of perhaps ten minutes. Monsieur, however, would serve himself well if he offered the driver an advance tip as an incentive to speedy driving. Why? 
Why, because... Here the guard consulted his watch, and Kirkwood very keenly regretted the loss of his own. Because this train, announced to arrive in Brussels some twenty minutes prior to the departure of the other, was already late. But yes, a matter of some ten minutes. Could that not be made up? Ah, monsieur, but who would say? The guard departed, doubtless with private views as to the madness of all English-speaking travellers. And there we are, commented Kirkwood, in factitious resignation. If we're obliged to stop overnight in Brussels, our friends will be on our back before we can get out in the morning. If they have to come by motor car, he reflected bitterly on the fact that, with but a little more money at his disposal, he too could hire a motor car and cry defiance to their persecutors. However, he amended with rising spirits, so much the better our chance of losing Mr. Hobbs. We must be ready to drop off the instant the train stops. He began to unfold another timetable, threatening again to lose himself completely, and was thrown into the utmost confusion by the touch of the girl's hand in appeal placed lightly on his own. And had she been observant, she might have seen a second time his knuckles whiten beneath the skin, as he asserted his self-control, though this time not over his temper. His eyes, dumbly eloquent, turned to meet hers. She was smiling. Please, she iterated, with the least imperative pressure on his hand, pushing the folder aside. I beg pardon, he muttered blankly. Is it quite necessary now to study those schedules? Haven't you decided to try for the Bruges Express? Why, yes, but... Then don't leave me to my thoughts all the time, Mr Kirkwood. There was a tremor of laughter in her voice, but her eyes were grave and earnest. I'm very weary of thinking round in a circle, and that, she concluded, with a nervous little laugh, is all I've had to do for days. I'm afraid I'm very stupid, he humoured her. This is the second time, you know, in the course of a very brief acquaintance, that you have found it necessary to remind me to talk to you. Oh, she brightened, that night at the Pless. But that was ages ago. It seems so, he admitted. So much has happened. Yes, he assented vaguely. She watched him, a little piqued by his absent-minded mood for a moment. Then, and not without a trace of malice, must I tell you again what to talk about, she asked. Forgive me. I was thinking about, if not talking to, you. I'd been wondering why it was that you left the Alethea at Queensborough to go on by steamer. And immediately he was sorry that his tactless query had swung the conversation to bear upon her father, the thought of whom could not but prove painful to her. But it was too late to mend matters. Already her evanescent flush of amusement had given place to remembrance. It was on my father's account, she told him in a steady voice, but with averted eyes. He is a very poor sailor, and the promise of a rough passage terrified him. I believe there was a difference of opinion about it, he disputing with Mr Mulready and Captain Stryker. That was just after we had left the anchorage. They both insisted that it was safer to continue by the Alethea, but he wouldn't listen to them and in the end had his way. Captain Stryker ran the brigantine into the mouth of the Medway, and put us ashore just in time to catch the steamer. Were you sorry for the change? I, she shuddered slightly, hardly, I think I hated the ship from the moment I set foot on board her. It was a dreadful place. It was all nightmarish that night, but it seemed most terrible on the Alethea with Captain Stryker, and that abominable Mr Hobbs. I think that my unhappiness had as much to do with my father's insistence on the change as anything. He, he was very thoughtful most of the time. Kirkwood shut his teeth on what he knew of the blackguard. I don't know why, she continued, wholly without affectation, but I was wretched from the moment you left me in the cab to wait while you went in to see Mrs Hallam. And when we left you at Bermondsey Old Stairs, after what you had said to me, I felt... I hardly knew what to say. Abandoned, in a way. But you were with your father, in his care. I know, but I was getting confused. Until then the excitement had kept me from thinking. But you made me think. I began to wonder, to question. But what could I do? She signified her helplessness with a quick and dainty movement of her hands. He is my father, and I am not yet of age, you know. 
I thought so, he confessed, troubled. It's very inconsiderate of you, you must admit. I don't understand. Because of the legal complication. I've no doubt your father can have the law on me, Kirkwood laughed uneasily, for taking you from his protection. Protection? she echoed warmly. If you call it that. Kidnapping, he said thoughtfully. I presume that would be the charge. Oh, she laughed, the notion to scorn. Besides, they must catch us first, mustn't they? Of course. And, with a simulation of confidence sadly deceitful, they shan't. Mr. Hobbs, to the contrary, notwithstanding. You make me share your confidence against my better judgment. I wish your better judgment would counsel you to share your confidence with me. He caught her up. If you would only tell me what it's all about, as far as you know, I'd be better able to figure out what we ought to do. Briefly, the girl sat silent, staring before her with sweet, sombre eyes. Then, in the very beginning, she told him with a conscious laugh, this sounds very story-bookish, I know. In the very beginning, George Burgoyne Callender, an American, married his cousin a dozen times removed, and an Englishwoman, Alice Burgoyne Hallam. Hallam? Wait, please. She sat up, bending forward and frowning down upon her interlacing glove fingers. She was finding it difficult to say what she must. Kirkwood watched hungrily the fair drooping head, the flawless profile clear and radiant against the night-blackened window, saw hot signals of shame burning on her cheek and throat and forehead. But never mind, he began awkwardly. No, she told him with decision. Please let me go on. She continued, stumbling, trusting to his sympathy to bridge the gaps in her narrative. My father, there was trouble of some sort. At all events, he disappeared when I was a baby. My mother died. I was brought up in a home of my great-uncle, Colonel George Burgoyne of the Indian Army, retired. My mother had been his favourite niece, they say. I presume that was why he cared for me. I grew up in his home in Cornwall. It was my home, just as he was my father in everything but fact. A year ago he died, leaving me everything. The townhouse in Frognall Street, his estate in Cornwall, everything was willed to me on condition that I must never live with my father, nor in any way contribute to his support. If I disobeyed, the entire estate without reserve was to go to his nearest of kin. Colonel Burgoyne was unmarried and had no children. The girl paused, lifting to Kirkwood's face her eyes, clear, fearless, truthful. I never was given to understand that there was anybody who might have inherited, other than myself, she declared. I see. Last week I received a letter signed with my father's name, begging me to appoint an interview with him in London. I did so. Guess how gladly. I was alone in the world, and he, my father, whom I had never thought to see, we met at this hotel, the Pless. He wanted me to come and live with him, said that he was growing old and lonely and needed a daughter's love and care. He told me that he had made a fortune in America and was amply able to provide for us both. As for my inheritance... He persuaded me that it was by rights the property of Frederick Hallam, Mrs. Hallam's son. I have met the young gentleman, interpolated Kirkwood. His name was new to me, but my father assured me that he was the next of kin mentioned in Colonel Burgoyne's will, and convinced me that I had no real right to the property. After all, he was my father. I agreed. I could not bear the thought of wronging anybody. I was to give up everything but my mother's jewels. It seems, my father said, I don't, I can't believe it now. She choked on a little dry sob. It was some time before she seemed able to continue. I was told that my great uncle's collection of jewels had been my mother's property. He had in life a passion for collecting jewels, and it had been his whim to carry them with him wherever he went. When he died in Frognall Street, they were in the safe by the head of his bed. I, in my grief, at first forgot them, and then afterwards carelessly put off removing them. To come back to my father, night before last we were to call on Mrs. Hallam. It was to be our last night in England. We were to sail for the continent on the private yacht of a friend of my father's the next morning. This is what I was told, and believed, you understand. That night Mrs. Hallam was dining at another table at the Pless, it seems. I did not then know her. When leaving... 
she put a note on our table by my father's elbow. I was astonished beyond words. He seemed much agitated, told me that he was called away on urgent business, a matter of life and death, and begged me to go alone to Frognall Street, get the jewels, and meet him at Mrs. Hallam's later. I wasn't altogether a fool, for I began dimly to suspect then that something was wrong, but I was a fool, for I consented to do as he desired. You understand? You know? I do indeed, replied Kirkwood grimly. I understand a lot of things now that I didn't five minutes ago. Please let me think. But the time he took for deliberation was short. He had hoped to find a way to spare her by sparing calendar, but momentarily he was becoming more impressed with the futility of dealing with her save in terms of candour, merciful though they might seem harsh. I must tell you, he said, that you have been outrageously misled, swindled and deceived. I have heard from your father's own lips that Mrs. Hallam was to pay him two thousand pounds for keeping you out of England and losing you your inheritance. I'm inclined to question, furthermore, the assertion that these jewels were your mother's. Frederick Hallam was the man who followed you into the Frognall Street house and attacked me on the stairs. Mrs. Hallam admits that he went there to get the jewels, but he didn't want anyone to know it. But that doesn't prove... Just a minute. Rapidly and concisely Kirkwood recounted the events wherein he had played a part. Subsequent to the adventure of Bermondsey Old Stairs, he was guilty of but one evasion. On one point only did he slur the truth. He conceived it his honourable duty to keep the girl in ignorance of his straitened circumstances. She was not to be distressed by knowledge of his distress, nor could he tolerate the suggestion of seeming to play for her sympathy. It was necessary, then, to invent a motive to excuse his return to 9 Frognall Street. I believe he chose to exaggerate the inquisitiveness of his nature, and threw in for good measure a desire to recover a prized trinket of no particular moment, esteemed for its associations and so forth. But whatever the fabrication, it passed muster. To the girl his motive seemed less important than the discoveries that resulted from them. I am afraid he concluded the summary of the confabulation he had overheard at the skylight of the Alethea's cabin. "'You'd best make up your mind that your father—' "'Yes,' whispered the girl huskily, and turned her face to the window, a quivering muscle in the firm young throat alone, betraying her emotion. "'It's a bad business,' he pursued relentlessly. "'Bad all round. Mulready in your father's pay tries to have him arrested, the better to rob him, Mrs. Hallam to secure your property for that precious pet Freddy, connives at if she doesn't instigate a kidnapping. Your father takes her money to deprive you of yours, which could profit him nothing so long as you remained in lawful possession of it, and at the same time he conspires to rob, through you, the rightful owners, if they are rightful owners, and if they are, why does Freddy Hallam go like a thief in the night to secure property that's his beyond dispute?' I don't really think you owe your father any further consideration. He waited patiently, eventually. No, the girl sobbed assent. It's this way. Calendar, counting on your sparing him in the end, is going to hound us. He's doing it now. There's Hobbs in the next car for proof. Until these jewels are returned, whether to Frognall Street or to Young Hallam, we're both in danger, both thieves in the sight of the law. And your father knows that, too. There's no profit to be had by discounting the temper of these people. They're as desperate a gang of swindlers as ever lived. They'll have those jewels if they have to go as far as murder. Mr. Kirkwood, she deprecated in horror. He wagged his head stubbornly, ominously. I've seen them in the roar. They're hot on our trail now. Ten to one, they'll be on our backs before we can get across the channel. Once in England... We will be comparatively safe. Until then, but I'm a brute. I'm frightening you. You are dreadfully, she confessed in a tremulous voice. Forgive me. If you look at the dark side first, the other seems all the brighter. Please don't worry. We'll pull through with flying colours, or my name's not Philip Kirkwood. I have every faith in you, she informed him, flawlessly sincere. When I think of all you've done and dared for me, on the mere suspicion that I needed your help. We'd best be getting ready, he interrupted hastily. Here's Brussels. It was so. 
lights in little clusters and long wheeling lines were leaping out of the darkness and flashing back as the train rumbled through the suburbs of the little paris of the north already the other passengers were bestirring themselves gathering together wraps and hand luggage and preparing for the journey's end rising kirkwood took down their two satchels from the overhead rack and waited in grim abstraction planning and counter-planning against the machinations in whose wiles they two had become so perilously entangled primarily there was hobbs to be dealt with no easy task for kirkwood dared not resort to violence nor in any way invite the attention of the authorities and threats would be an idle waste of breath in the case of that corrupt and malignant little cockney himself as keen as any needle adept in all the artful resources of the underworld whence he had sprung and further primed for action by that master rogue calendar the train was pulling slowly into the station when he reluctantly abandoned his little unfeasible scheme for shaking off the little englishman and concluded that their salvation was only to be worked out through everlasting vigilance incessant movement and the favour of the blind goddess fortune there was comfort of a sort in the reflection that the divinity of chance is at least blind. Her favours are impartially distributed. The swing of the wheel of the world is not always to the advantage of the wrongdoer and the scamp. He saw nothing of Hobbs as they alighted and hastened from the station, and hardly had time to waste looking for him, since their train had failed to make up the precious ten minutes. Consequently, he dismissed the fellow from his thoughts until, with Brussels lingering in their memories, a garish vision of brilliant streets and glowing cafes glimpsed furtively from their cab windows during its wild dash over the broad mid city boulevards at midnight they settled themselves in a carriage of the bruges express they were speeding along through the open country with a noisy clatter then a minute's investigation sufficed to discover the mate of the alethea serenely ensconced in the coach behind the little man seemed rarely complacent and impudently greeted kirkwood's scowling visage as the latter peered through the window in the coach door with a smirk and a waggish wave of his hand the american by main strength of will-power mastered an impulse to enter and wring his neck and return to the girl more disturbed than he cared to let her know there resulted from his review of the case but one plan for outwitting mr hobbs and that lay in trusting to his confidence that kirkwood and dorothy calendar would proceed as far towards ostend as the train would take them namely to the limit of the run bruges thus inspired kirkwood took counsel with the girl and when the train paused at ghent they made an unostentatious exit from their coach finding themselves when the express had rolled on into the west upon a station platform in a foreign city at nine minutes past one o'clock in the morning but at length without their shadow mr hobbs had gone on to bruges end of chapter sixteen part one Recording by Michelle Eaton Chapter 16, Part 2 of The Black Bag This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Michelle Eaton The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance Chapter 16, Part 2 Kirkwood sped his journeyings with an unspoken malediction, and collected himself to cope with a situation which was to prove hardly more happy for them than the espionage they had just eluded. The primal flush of triumph which had saturated the American's humour on this signal success proved but fictive and transitory when inquiry of the station attendants educed the information that the two earliest trains to be obtained with the 509 for Dunkirk and the 537 for Ostend. A minimum delay of four hours was to be endured, in the face of many contingent features, singularly unpleasant to contemplate. The station waiting room was on the point of closing for the night, and Kirkwood, already alarmed by the rapid ebb of the money he had had of calendar, dared not subject his finances to the strain of a night's lodging at one of Ghent's hotels. He found himself forced to be cruel to be kind to the girl, and Dorothy's cheerful acquiescence to their sole alternative of tramping the street until daybreak did nothing to alleviate Kirkwood's exasperation. 
it was permitted them to occupy a bench outside the station there the girl her head pillowed on the treasure bag napped uneasily while kirkwood plodded restlessly to and fro up and down the platform communing with the shade of care and addling his poor weary wits with the problem of the future not so much his own as the future of the unhappy child for whose welfare he had assumed responsibility dark for both of them in his understanding to-morrow loomed darkest for her not until the grey formless light of the dawn dusk was wavering over the land did he cease his perambulations then a gradual stir of life in the city streets together with the appearance of a station porter or two opening the waiting rooms and preparing them against the traffic of the day warned him that he must rouse his charge he paused and stood over her reluctant to disturb her rest such as it was his heart torn with compassion for her his soul embittered by the cruel irony of their estate if what he understood were true a king's ransom was secreted within the cheap imitation leather satchel which served her for a pillow but it availed her nothing for her comfort if what he believed were true she was absolute mistress of that treasure of jewels yet that night she had been forced to sleep on a hard uncushioned bench in the open air and this morning he must waken her to the life of a hunted thing a week ago she had had at her command every luxury known to the civilised world to-day she was friendless but for his inefficient worthless self and in a strange land a week ago had he known her then he had been free to tell her of his love to offer her the protection of his name as well as his devotion to-day he was an all but penniless vagabond and there could be no dishonour deeper than to let her know the nature of his heart's desire was ever lover hedged from a declaration to his mistress by circumstances so hateful so untoward he could have raged and railed against his fate like any madman for he desired her greatly and she was very lovely in his sight if her night's rest had been broken and but a mockery she showed few signs of it the faint wan complexion of fatigue seemed only to enhance the beauty of her maidenhood her lips were as fresh and desirous as the dewy petals of a crimson rose beneath her eyes soft shadows lurked where her lashes lay tremulous upon her cheeks of satin she was to him of all created things the most wonderful the most desirable the temptation of his longing seemed more than he could long withstand but resist he must or part for ever with any title to her consideration or his own he shut his teeth and knotted his brows in a transport of desire to touch if only with his finger-tips the woven wonder of her hair and thus she saw him when without warning she awoke bewilderment at first informed the wide brown eyes then as their drowsiness vanished a little laughter a little tender mirth good morning sir knight of the sombre countenance she cried standing up am i so utterly disreputable that you find it necessary to frown on me so darkly he shook his head smiling i know i'm a fright she asserted vigorously shaking out the folds of her pleated skirt and as for my hat it will never be on straight but then you wouldn't know it seems all right he replied vacantly then please to try to look a little happier since you find me quite presentable i do without lifting her bended head she looked up laughing not ill-pleased you'd say so really commonplace enough this banter this pitiful endeavour to be oblivious of their common misery but like the look she gave him her words rang in his head like potent fumes of wine he turned away utterly disconcerted for the time knowing only that he must overcome his weakness far down the railway tracks there rose a murmuring that waxed to a rumbling roar a passing porter answered kirkwood's inquiry it was the night boat train from ostend he picked up their bags and drew the girl into the waiting-room troubled by a sickening foreboding through the window they watched the train roll in and stop among others alighted smirking the unspeakable hobbs he lifted his hat and bowed jauntily to the waiting-room window making it plain that his keen eyes had discovered them instantly kirkwood's heart sank with the hopelessness of it all 
if the railway directorates of europe conspired against them what chance had they if the night boat train from ostend had only had the decency to be twenty-five minutes late instead of arriving promptly on the minute of four forty-five they too might have escaped by the five o nine for dunkirk and calais there remained but a single untried ruse in his bag of tricks mercifully it might suffice miss calendar said kirkwood from his heart just as soon as i get you home safe and sound i am going to take a day off hunting up that little villain and flay him alive in the meantime i forgot to dine last night and am reminded that we had better forage for breakfast hobbs dogged them at a safe distance while they sallied forth and in a neighbouring street discovered an early bird bakery here they were able to purchase rolls steaming from the oven fresh pats of golden butter wrapped in clean lettuce leaves and milk in twin bottles all of which they prosaically carried with them back to the station lacking leisure as they did to partake of the food before train time without attempting concealment hobbs he knew was eavesdropping round the corner of the door kirkwood purchased at the ticket window passages on the dunkirk train mr hobbs promptly flattered him by imitation and so jealous of his luck was kirkwood by this time grown through continual disappointment that he did not even let the girl into his plans until they were aboard the five o nine in a compartment all to themselves then having with his own eyes seen mr hobbs dodge on to the third compartment in the rear of the same carriage kirkwood astonished the girl by requesting her to follow him and together they left by the door opposite that by which they had entered the engine was running up and down a scale of staccato snorts in preparation for the race and the cars were on the edge of moving couplings clanking wheels a-groan ere mr hobbs condescended to join them between the tracks wearily disheartened kirkwood reopened the door flung the bags in and helped the girl back into their despised compartment the quicker route to england via ostend was now out of the question as for himself he waited for a brace of seconds eyeing wickedly the ubiquitous hobbs who had popped back into his compartment but stood ready to pop out again at the least encouragement in the meantime he was pleased to shake a friendly foot at mr kirkwood thrusting that member out through the half-open door only the timely departure of the train compelling him to rejoin dorothy at once if at all prevented the american from adding murder to the already noteworthy catalogue of his high crimes and misdemeanours their simple meal consumed to the ultimate drop and crumb while the dunkirk train meandered serenely through a sunny smiling flemish countryside somewhat revived their jaded spirits after all they were young enviably dowered with youth's exuberant elasticity of mood the world was bright in the dawning the night had fled leaving naught but an evil memory best of all things they were together tacitly they were agreed that somehow the future would take care of itself and all be well with them for a time they laughed and chattered pretending that the present held no cares or troubles but soon the girl nestling her head in the corner of the dingy cushions was smiling ever more drowsily on kirkwood and presently she slept in good earnest the warm blood ebbing and flowing beneath the exquisite texture of her cheeks the ghost of an unconscious smile quivering about the sensitive scarlet mouth the breeze through the open window at her side wantoning at will in the sunlight witchery of her hair and kirkwood worn with sleepless watching dwelt in longing upon the dear innocent allure of her until the ache in his heart had grown well-nigh insupportable then instinctively turned his gaze upwards searching his heart reading the faith and desire of it so that at length knowledge and understanding came to him of his weakness and strength and the clean love that he bore for her and gladdened he sat dreaming in waking the same clear dreams that modelled her unconscious lips secretly for laughter and the joy of living when dunkirk halted their progress they were obliged to alight and change cars hobbs a discreetly sinister shadow at the end of the platform by schedule they were to arrive in calais about the middle of the forenoon with a wait of three hours to be bridged before the departure of the dover packet that would be an anxious time the prospect of it rendered both dorothy and kirkwood doubly anxious throughout this final stage of their flight in three hours anything could happen or be brought about neither could forget that it was quite within the bounds of possibilities for calendar to be awaiting them in calais presuming that hobbs had been acute enough to guess their plans 
and advise his employer by telegraph, the latter could readily have anticipated their arrival, whether by sea in the brigantine or by land, taking the direct route via Brussels and Lille. If such proved to be the case, it was scarcely sensible to count upon the arch-adventurer contenting himself with a waiting roll like Hobbs. With such unhappy apprehensions for a stimulant, between them the man and the girl contrived a makeshift counter-stratagem, or it were more accurate to say that Kirkwood proposed it, while Dorothy rejected, disputed, and at length accepted it, albeit with sad misgivings, for it involved a separation that might not prove temporary. Together they could never escape the surveillance of Mr. Hobbs. Parted, he would be obliged to follow one or the other. The task of misleading the Alethea's mate Kirkwood undertook, delegating to the girl the duty of escaping when he could provide her the opportunity of keeping under cover until the hour of sailing and then proceeding to England with the Gladstone bag, alone if Kirkwood was unable or thought it inadvisable to join her on the boat. In furtherance of this design, a majority of the girl's belongings were transferred from her travelling bag to Kirkwood's, the Gladstone taking their place, and the young man provided her with voluminous instructions, a revolver which she did not know how to handle, and declared she would never use for any consideration, and enough money to pay for her accommodation at the Terminus Hotel, near the pier, and for two passages to London. It was agreed that she should secure the steamer booking, lest Kirk would be delayed until the last moment. These arrangements concluded, the pair of blessed idiots sat steeped in melancholy silence, avoiding each other's eyes until the train drew in at the Gare Central Calais. In profound silence, too, they left their compartment and passed through the station into the quiet sun-drenched streets of the seaport, Hobbs hovering solicitously in the offing. Without comment or visible relief of mind, they were aware that their fears had been without apparent foundation. They saw no sign of calendar, striker, or Mulready. The circumstance, however, counted for nothing. One or all of the adventurers might arrive in Calais at any minute. Momentarily, more miserable as the time of parting drew nearer, done with unhappiness, they turned aside from the main thoroughfares of the city, leaving the business section, and gained the sleepier side streets, bordered by the residences of the proletariat, where for blocks none but children were to be seen, and of them but few, quaint, sober little bodies playing almost noiselessly in their door-yards. At length Kirkwood spoke. Let's make it the corner, he said, without looking at the girl. It's a short block to the next street. You hurry to the terminus and lock yourself in your room. Have the management book both passages. Don't run the risk of going to the pier yourself. I'll make things interesting for Mr. Hobbs and join you as soon as I can, if I can. You must, replied the girl, I shan't go without you. But do Miss Callender, he exclaimed aghast. I don't care. I know I agreed, she declared mutinously. But I won't. I can't. Remember, I shall wait for you. But, but perhaps, if you have to stay, it will be because there's danger, won't it? And what would you think of me if I deserted you then? Af after all you've, you've done, please don't waste time arguing whether you come at one today, tomorrow, or a week from tomorrow. I shall be waiting, you may be sure. Good-bye. They had turned the corner walking slowly side by side. Hobbs, for the first time, caught off his guard, and dropped behind more than half a long block. But now Kirkwood's quick sidelong glance discovered the mate in the act of taking alarm and quickening his pace. None the less, the American was at the time barely conscious of anything other than a wholly unexpected furtive pressure of the girl's gloved fingers on his own. Goodbye, she whispered. He caught at her hand, protesting. Dorothy, goodbye, she repeated breathlessly, with a queer little catch in her voice. God be with you, Philip, and, and send you safely back to me. And she was running away. Dumbfounded with dismay, seeing in a flash how all his plans might be set at naught by this her unforeseen insubordination, he took a step or two after her, but she was fleet of foot, and remembering Hobbs, he halted. By this time the mate too was running, Kirkwood could hear the heavy pounding of his clumsy feet. Already Dorothy had almost gained the farther corner, as she whisked round it with a flutter of skirts, Kirkwood dodged hastily behind a gate-post. 
a thought later hobbs appeared head down chest out eyes straining for sight of his quarry pelting along for dear life as round in the corner he stretched out in swifter stride kirkwood was inspired to put a spoke in his wheel and a foot thrust suddenly out from behind the gatepost accomplished his purpose with more success than he had dared anticipate stumbling the mate plunged headlong arms and legs a sprawl and the momentum of his pace though checked carried him along the sidewalk face downwards a full yard ere he could stay himself kirkwood stepped out of the gateway and sheered off as hobbs picked himself up something which he did rather slowly as if in a daze without comprehension of the cause of his misfortune and for a moment he stood pulling his wits together and swaying as though on the point of resuming his rudely interrupted chase when the noise of kirkwood's heels brought him about face in a twinkling oh it's you he snarled in a temper as vicious as his countenance and both of these were much the worse for wear and tear myself admitted kirkwood fairly and then in a gleam of humour weren't you looking for me his rage seemed to take the little cockney and shake him by the throat he trembled from head to foot his face shockingly congested and spat out dust and fragments of lurid blasphemy like an infuriated cat of a sudden where's the girl he sputtered thickly as his quick shifting eyes for the first time noted dorothy's absence miss calendar has other business none with you i've taken the liberty of stopping you because i have a word or two oh you have have you god strike me blind but i've a word for you too and over that bag and look nippy or i'll make you pay for what you've done to me i'll make you pay he iterated hoarsely edging closer and it over or you've got another guess kirkwood began but saved his breath in deference to an imperative demand on him for instant defensive action to some extent he had underestimated the brute courage of the fellow the violent desperate courage that is distilled of anger in men of his kind despising him deeming him incapable of any overt act of villainy kirkwood had been a little less wary than he would have been with calendar or mulready hobbs had seen more of the craven type which strike a grace so conspicuously but now the american was to be taught discrimination to learn that if striker's nature was like a snake's for low cunning and deviousness hobbs's soul was the soul of a viper almost imperceptibly he had advanced upon kirkwood almost insensibly his right hand had moved towards his chest now with a movement marvellously deft it had slipped in and out of his breast pocket and a six-inch blade of tarnished steel was winging towards kirkwood's throat with the speed of light instinctively he stepped back as instinctively he guarded with his right forearm lifting the hand that held the satchel the knife catching in his sleeve scratched the arm beneath painfully and simultaneously was twisted from the mate's grasp while in his surprise kirkwood's grip on the bag handle relaxed it was torn forcibly from his fingers just as he received a heavy blow on his chest from the mate's fist he staggered back by the time he had recovered from the shock hobbs was a score of feet away the satchel tucked under his arm his body bent almost double running like a jackrabbit ere kirkwood could get under way in pursuit the mate had dodged out of sight round the corner when the american caught sight of him again he was far down the block and bettering his pace with every jump he was approaching also some six or eight good citizens of calais men of the labouring class at a guess their attention attracted by his frantic flight they stopped to wonder one or two moved as though to intercept him and he doubled out into the middle of the street with the quickness of thought an instant later he shot round another corner and disappeared the native streaming after in hot chase electrified by the inspiring strains of stop a thief or its french equivalent kirkwood cheering them on in the same wild cry followed to the farther street and there paused so winded and weak with laughter that he was fain to catch at a fence picket for support standing thus he saw other denizens of calais spring as if from the ground miraculously to swell the hue and cry and a dumpling of a gendarme materialised from nowhere at all to fall in behind the rabble waving his sword above his head and screaming at the top of his lungs 
the while his fat legs twinkled for all the world like thick sausage links marvellously animated the mob straggled round yet another corner and was gone its clamour diminished on the still spring air and kirkwood recovering abandoned mr hobb to the justice of the high gods and the french system of jurisprudence at least he hoped the latter would take an interest in the case if haply hobbs were laid by the heels and went his way rejoicing as for the scratch on his arm it was nothing as he presently demonstrated to his complete satisfaction in the seclusion of a chance saint fiacre kirkwood commissioning it to drive him to the american consulate made his diagnosis en route wound a handkerchief round the negligible wound rolled down his sleeve and forgot it altogether in the joys of picturing to himself hobbs in the act of opening the satchel in expectation of finding therein the gladstone bag at the consulate door he paid off the driver and dismissed him the fiacre had served his purpose and he could find his way to the terminus hotel at infinitely less expense he had a considerably harder task before him as he ascended the steps to the consular doorway knocked and made known the nature of his errand no malicious destiny could have timed the hour of his call more appositely the consul was at home and at the disposal of his fellow citizens within bounds in the course of thirty minutes or so kirkwood emerged with dignity from the consulate his face crimsoned to the hair his soul smarting with shame and humiliation and left an amused official representative of his country's government with the impression of having been entertained to the point of ennui by an exceptionally clumsy but pertinacious liar for the better part of the succeeding hour kirkwood circumnavigated the neighbourhood of the steamer pier and the terminus hotel striving to render himself as inconspicuous as he felt insignificant and keenly on the alert for any sign or news of hobbs in this pursuit he was pleasantly disappointed at noon precisely his suspense grown too onerous for his strength of will throwing caution and their understanding to the winds he walked boldly into the terminus and inquired for miss calendar the assurance he received that she was in safety under its roof did not deter him from sending up his name and asking her to receive him in the public lounge he required the testimony of his senses to convince him that no harm had come to her in the long hour and a half that had elapsed since their separation woman-like she kept him waiting alone in the public rooms of the hotel he suffered excruciating torments how was he to know that calendar had not arrived and found his way to her when at length she appeared on the threshold of the apartment bringing with her the travelling bag and looking wonderfully the better for her ninety minutes of complete repose and privacy the relief he experienced was so intense that he remained transfixed in the middle of the floor momentarily able neither to speak nor to move on her part so fagged and distraught did he seem that at sight of his careworn countenance she hurried to him with outstretched compassionate hands and a low pitiful cry of concern forgetful entirely of that which he himself had forgotten the emotion she had betrayed on parting oh nothing wrong he hastened to reassure her with a sorry ghost of his familiar grin only i have lost hobbs and the satchel with your things and there's no sign yet of mr calendar we can feel pretty comfortable now and and i thought it's time we had something like a meal the narrative of his adventure which he delivered over their déjeuner à la fourche contained no mention either of his rebuff at the american consulate or the scratch he had sustained during hobbs murderous assault the one could not concern her the other would seem but a bid for her sympathy he counted it a fortunate thing that the mate's knife had been keen enough to penetrate the cloth of his sleeve without tearing it the slit it had left was barely noticeable and he purposely diverted the girl with flashes of humorous description so that they discussed both meal and episode in a mood of wholesome merriment it was concluded all too soon for the taste of either by the waiter's announcement that the steamer was on the point of sailing outwardly composed inwardly quaking they boarded the packet meeting with no misadventure whatever if we are to accept the circumstance that when the restaurant bill was settled and the girl had punctiliously surrendered his change with the tickets kirkwood found himself in possession of precisely one franc and twenty centimes he groaned in spirit to think how differently he might have been fixed had he not in his infatuated spirit of honesty 
been so anxious to give calendar more than ample value for his money an inexorable anxiety held them both near the gangway until it was cast off and the boat began to draw away from the pier then and not till then did an unimpressive small figure of a man detach itself from the shield of a pile of luggage and advance to the pier head no second glance was needed to identify mr hobbs and until the perspective dwarfed him indistinguishably he was to be seen alternately waving kirkwood ironic farewell and blowing violent kisses to miss calendar from the tips of his soiled fingers so he had escaped to rest at first by turns indignant and relieved to realise that thereafter they were to move in scenes in which his hateful shadow would not form an essentially component part subsequently kirkwood fell a prey to prophetic terrors it was not alone fear of retribution that had induced hobbs to relinquish his persecution or so kirkwood became convinced if the mate's calculation had allowed for them the least fraction of a chance to escape apprehension on the farthest shores of the channel nor fears nor threats would have prevented him from sailing with the fugitives far from having left danger behind them on the continent kirkwood believed in his secret heart that they were but flying to encounter it beneath the smoky pall of london end of chapter sixteen part two recording by michelle eaton Chapter 17 of The Black Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance. Chapter 17 Rogues and Vagabonds. A westering sun, striking down through the drab exhalations of ten thousand sooty chimney-pots, tinted the atmosphere with a hue of copper. The glance that wandered purposelessly out through the carriage windows, recoiled, repelled by the endless dreary vista of the Surrey side's unnumbered roofs, or, probing instantaneously the hopeless depths of some grim narrow thoroughfare, fleetingly disclosed, as the evening boat-train from Dover swung on toward Charing Cross its trucks level with the eaves of southwark's dwellings was saddened by the thought that in all the world squalor such as this should obtain and flourish unrelieved for perhaps the tenth time in the course of the journey kirkwood withdrew his gaze from the window and turned to the girl a question ready framed upon his lips are you quite sure he began and then alive to the clear and penetrating perception in the brown eyes that smiled into his from under their level brows, he stammered and left the query uncompleted. Continuing to regard him steadily and smilingly, Dorothy shook her head in playful denial and protest. "'Do you know,' she commented, "'that this is about the fifth repetition of that identical question within the last quarter hour?' "'How do you know what I meant to say?' he demanded, staring." I can see it in your eyes. Besides, you've talked and thought of nothing else since we left the boat. Won't you believe me, please, when I say there's absolutely not a soul in London to whom I could go and ask for shelter? I don't think it's very nice of you to be so openly anxious to get rid of me. This latter was so essentially undeserved and so artlessly insincere that he must needs, of course, treat it with all seriousness. "'That isn't fair, Miss Callender. Really, it's not. "'What am I to think? "'I've told you any number of times "'that it's only an hour's ride on to Chiltern, "'where the Peerfords will be glad to take me in. "'You may depend upon it. "'By eight to-night, at the latest, "'you'll have me off your hands. "'The drag and worry that I've been ever since. "'Don't!' he pleaded vehemently. "'Please! "'You know it isn't that.' I don't want you off my hands, ever. That is to say, I, uh... Here he was smitten with a dumbness, and sat, aghast at the enormity of his blunder, entreating her forgiveness with eyes that, very likely, pleaded his cause more eloquently than he guessed. I mean, he floundered on presently, in the fatuous belief that he would this time be able to control both mind and tongue, what i mean is i'd be glad to go on serving you in any way i might to the end of time 
if you'd give me... He left the declaration inconclusive, a stroke of diplomacy that would have graced an infinitely more adept wooer, but he used it all unconsciously. Oh, Lord, he groaned in spirit, worse and more of it. Why in thunder can't I say the right thing, right? Egotistically absorbed by the problem thus formulated, he was heedless of her failure to respond, and remained pensively preoccupied until roused by the grinding and jolting of the train as it slowed to a halt preparatory to crossing the bridge. Then he sought to read his answer in the eyes of Dorothy, but she was looking away. Staring thoughtfully out over the billowing sea of roofs that merged elusively into the haze long ere it reached the horizon, and Kirkwood could see the pulsing of the warm blood in her throat and cheeks, and the glamorous light that leaped and waned in her eyes as the ruddy evening sunlight warmed them was something any man might be glad to live for and die for and he saw that she had understood, had grasped the thread of meaning that ran through the clumsy fabric of his halting speech and his sudden silences. She had understood without resentment. While, incredulous, he wrestled with the wonder of this fond discovery. She grew conscious of his gaze, and turned her head to meet it with one fearless and sweet, if troubled. "'Dear Mr. Kirkwood,' she said gently, bending forward as if to read between the lines anxiety had graven on his countenance. "'Won't you tell me, please, what it can be that so worries you? Is it possible that you still have a fear of my father? But don't you know that he can do nothing now, now that we're safe? We have only to take a cab to Paddington Station, and then—' "'You mustn't underestimate the resource and ability of Mr. Callender. he told her gloomily. "'We've got a chance, no more. It wasn't—' He shut his teeth on his unruly tongue. "'Too late.' Woman quick, she caught him up. "'It wasn't that? Then what was it that worried you? If it's something that affects me, is it kind and right of you not to tell me?' "'It—it it affects us both,' he conceded drearily. "'I—' I don't. The wretched embarrassment of the confession befogged his wits. He felt unable to frame the words. He appealed speechlessly for tolerance, with a face utterly woebegone and eyes piteous. The train began to move slowly across the Thames to Charing Cross. Mercilessly, the girl persisted. We've only a minute more. Surely you can trust me. In exasperation, he interrupted almost rudely. It's only this. I... I'm strapped. Strapped? She knitted her brows over this fresh specimen of American slang. Flat-strapped. Busted. Broke. On my uppers. Down and out. He reeled off synonyms without a smile. I haven't enough money to pay cab fare across the town. Oh, she interpolated, enlightened. To say nothing of taking us to Chiltern. I couldn't buy you a glass of water if you were thirsty. There isn't a soul on earth, within hail, who would trust me with a quarter. I mean a shilling, across London Bridge. I'm the original luckless wonder, and the only genuine Jonah extant. With a face the hue of fire, he cocked his eyebrows askew, and attempted to laugh unconcernedly to hide his bitter shame. I've led you out of the frying pan into the fire, and I don't know what to do. Please, call me names. And in a single instant, all that he had consistently tried to avoid doing had been irretrievably done. If, with dawning comprehension, dismay flickered in her eyes, such dismay as such a confession can rouse only in one who, like Dorothy Callender, has never known the want of a penny. It was swiftly driven out to make place for the truest and most gracious and unselfish solicitude. "'Oh, poor Mr. Kirkwood! And it's all because of me. You've beggared yourself.' "'Not precisely. I was beggared to begin with.' He hastened to disclaim her extravagant generosity, of which she accused him. "'I had only three or four pounds to my name that night we met. I haven't told you. I—' "'You've told me nothing, nothing whatever about yourself,' she said reproachfully. "'I didn't want to bother you with my troubles. I tried not to talk about myself. 
You knew I was an American, but I'm worse than that. I'm a Californian, from San Francisco. He tried unsuccessfully to make light of it. I told you I was the luckless wonder. If I'd ever had any luck, I would have stored a little money away. As it was, I lived on my income, left my principal in Frisco, and when the earthquake came, it wiped me out completely. And you were going home that night we made you miss your steamer. It was my own fault, and I'm glad this blessed minute that I did miss it. Nice sort I'd have been to go off and leave you at the mercy. Please, I want to think. I'm trying to remember how much you've gone through. Precisely what I don't want you to do. Anyway, I did nothing more than any other fellow would have. Please don't give me credit that I don't deserve. But she was not listening, and a pause fell, while the train crawled warily over the trestle, as if in fear of the foul, muddy flood below. And there's no way I can repay you. There's nothing to be repaid, he contended stoutly. She clasped her hands and let them fall gently in her lap. I've not a farthing in the world. I never dreamed. I'm so sorry, Mr. Kirkwood. Terribly, terribly sorry. But what can we do? I can't consent to be a burden. But you're not. You're the one thing that— He swerved sharply at an abrupt tangent. There's one thing we can do, of course. She looked up inquiringly. Craven Street is just round the corner. Yes, wonderingly. I mean, we must go to Mrs. Hallam's house first off. It's too late now, after five, else we could deposit the jewels in some bank. Since, since they are no longer yours, the only thing, and the proper thing to do, is to place them in safety or in the hands of their owner. If you take them directly to young Hallam, your hands will be clear, and— I never did such a thing in my life, Miss Calendar, but if he's got a spark of gratitude in his make-up, I ought to be able to, uh, to borrow a pound or so of him. Do you think so? She shook her head in doubt. I don't know. I know so little of such things. You are right. We must take him the jewels. But— Her voice trailed off into a sigh of profound perturbation. He dared not meet her look. Beneath his wandering gaze, a country consul steamboat darted swiftly down the stream from Charing Cross Pier in the shadow of the railway bridge. It seemed curious to reflect that from that very floating pier he had started first upon his quest of the girl beside him, only, if he had to count, three nights ago. Three days and three nights! Altogether incredible seemed the transformation they had wrought in the complexion of the world yet nothing material was changed he lifted his eyes beyond the river rose the embankment crawling with traffic backed by the green of the gardens and the shimmering walls of glass and stone of the great hotels their windows glowing weirdly golden in the late sunlight a little downstream cleopatra's needle rose sadly the worse for london smoke flanked by its couchant sphinxes wearing a nimbus of circling, sweeping, swooping, wheeling gulls. Farther down, from the foot of that magnificent pile, Somerset House, Waterloo Bridge, sprang over stream in its graceful arch. All as of yesterday, yet all changed. Why? Because a woman had entered into his life, because he had learned the lesson of love and had looked into the bright face of romance. With a jar, the train started and began to move more swiftly. Kirkwood lifted the traveling bag to his knees. "'Don't forget,' he said with some difficulty, "'you're to stick by me whatever happens. You mustn't desert me.' "'You know,' the girl reproved him. "'I know, but there must be no misunderstanding. Don't worry. We'll win out yet. I've a plan.' "'Splendid day, Mendox. He had not the glimmering of a plan.' The engine panting, the train drew in beneath the vast sounding dome of the station to an accompaniment of dull thunderings, and stopped finally. Kirkwood got out, not without a qualm of regret at leaving the compartment. Therein, at least, they had some title to consideration, by virtue of their tickets. Now they were utterly vagabondish, penniless adventurers. The girl joined him. 
Slowly, elbow to elbow, the treasure bag between them, they made their way down toward the gates, atoms in a tide rip of humanity. Two streams of passengers meeting on the narrow strip of platform, the one making for the streets, the other for the suburbs. Hurried and jostled, the girl clinging tightly to his arm lest they be separated in the crush, they came to the ticket wicket. Beyond the barrier surged a sea of hats, shining toppers, dignified and upstanding, the outward and visible manifestation of the sturdy, stodgy British spirit of respectability. Bowlers, round and sleek and humble, shapeless caps with cloth visors, manufactured of outrageous plaids, flower-like miracles of millinery from Bond Street, strangely plumed monstrosities from Petticoat Lane and Mile End Road. Beneath any one of these might lurk the maleficent brain, the spying eyes of Calendar, or one of his creatures, beneath all of them that he encountered Kirkwood peered in fearful inquiry. Yet, when they had passed unhindered the ordeal of the wickets, had run the gauntlet of those thousand eyes without lighting in any pair a spark of recognition, he began to bear himself with more assurance, to be sensible to a grateful glow of hope. Perhaps Hobbes's telegram had not reached its destination, for unquestionably the mate would have wired his chief. Perhaps some accident had befallen the conspirators. Perhaps the police had apprehended them. No matter how, one hoped against hope that they had been thrown off the trail. And, indeed, it seemed as if they must have been misguided in some providential manner. On the other hand, it would be the crassest of indiscretions to linger about the place an instant longer than absolutely necessary. Outside the building, however, they paused perforce, undergoing the cross-fire of the congregated cabbies it being the first time that he had ever felt called upon to leave the station afoot. Kirkwood cast about irresolutely, seeking the sidewalk leading to the strand. Abruptly he caught the girl by the arm, and unceremoniously hurried her toward a waiting hansom. "'Quick!' he begged her. "'Jump right in, not an instant to spare.' She nodded brightly, lips firm with courage, eyes shining. "'My father?' "'Yes.' Kirkwood glanced back over his shoulder. He hasn't seen us yet. They've just driven up. Strikers with him. They're getting down. And to himself, Oh, the devil! cried the panic-stricken young man. He drew back to let the girl precede him into the cab. At the same time, he kept an eye on Calendar, whose conveyance stood half the length of the station front away. The fat adventurer had finished paying off the driver, standing on the deck of the hansom. Stryker was already out, towering above the mass of people, and glaring about him with his hawk-keen vision. Calendar had started to alight. His foot was leaving the step when Stryker's glance singled out their quarry. Instantly he turned and spoke to his confederate. Calendar wheeled like a flash, peering eagerly in the direction indicated by the captain's index finger. Then, snapping instructions to his driver, threw himself heavily back on the seat. Stryker, awkward on his land legs, stumbled and fell in an ill-calculated attempt to hoist himself hastily back into the vehicle. To the delay thus occasioned alone, Kirkwood and Dorothy owed a respite of freedom. Their hansom was already swinging down toward the great gates of the yard, the American standing to make the driver comprehend the necessity for using the utmost speed in reaching the Craven Street address. The man proved both intelligent and obliging. Kirkwood had barely time to drop down beside the girl, ere the cab was swinging out into the strand to the peril of the toes belonging to a number of righteously indignant pedestrians. "'Good boy!' commented Kirkwood cheerfully. That's the greatest comfort of all London, the surprising intellectual strength the average cabbie displays when you promise him a tip. Great heavens, he cried, reading the girl's dismayed expression. A tip! I never thought— His face lengthened dismally. His eyebrows worked awry. Now we are in for it. Dorothy said nothing. He turned in the seat, twisting his neck to peep through the small rear window. "'I don't see their cab,' he announced. "'But of course they're after us. "'However, Craven Street's just round the corner. 
if we get there first, I don't fancy Freddie Hallam will have a cordial reception for our pursuers. They must have been on watch at Cannon Street, and finding we were not coming in that way, of course they were expecting us because of Hobbs' wire, they took cab for Charing Cross. Lucky for us. Or is it lucky? he added, doubtfully to himself. The hansom whipped round the corner into Craven Street. Kirkwood sprang up, grasping the treasure bag, ready to jump the instant they pulled in toward Mrs. Hallam's dwelling. But as they drew near upon the address, he drew back with an exclamation of amazement. The house was closed, showing a blank face to the street, blinds drawn close down in the windows, area gate padlocked, an estate agent's board projecting from above the doorway, advertising the property, to be let, furnished. Kirkwood looked back, craning his neck round the side of the cab. At the moment, another hansom was breaking through the rank of humanity on the Strand crossing. He saw one or two figures leap desperately from beneath the horse's hoofs. Then the cab shot out swiftly down the street. The American stood up again, catching the cabby's eye. "'Drive on!' he cried excitedly. "'Don't stop! Drive as fast as you dare!' "'Where to, sir?' See that cab behind? Don't let it catch us. Shake it off. Lose it somehow. But, for the love of heaven, don't let it catch us. I'll make it worth your while. Do you understand? Yes, sir. The driver looked briefly over his shoulder and lifted his whip. Don't worry, sir, he cried, entering into the spirit of the game with gratifying zest. Shan't let em over all you, sir. Mind your head. And as Kirkwood ducked, the whiplash shot out over the roof with a crack like the report of a pistol. Startled, the horse leaped indignantly forward. Momentarily, the cab seemed to leave the ground, then settled down to a pace that carried them round the Avenue Theatre and across Northumberland Avenue into Whitehall Place, apparently on a single wheel. A glance behind showed Kirkwood that already they had gained the pursuing hansom having lost ground through greater caution in crossing the main travel thoroughfare. "'Good little horse!' he applauded. A moment later he was endorsing without reserve the generalship of their cabby. The quick westward turn that took them into Whitehall, over across from the horse guards, likewise placed them in a pocket of traffic. A practically impregnable press of vehicles closed in behind them ere Calendar's conveyance could follow out of the side street. That the same conditions, but slightly modified, hemmed them in ahead, went for nothing in Kirkwood's estimation. "'Good driver!' he approved heartily. "'He's got a head on his shoulders.' The girl found her voice. "'How?' she demanded in a breath, face blank with consternation. "'How did you dare?' "'Dare?' he echoed exultantly, and in his veins excitement was running like liquid fire. Why shouldn't I dare for you, Dorothy? What have you not? she amended softly, adding with a shade of timidity, Philip. The long lashes swept up from her cheeks, like clouds revealing stars, unmasking eyes radiant and brave to meet his own. Then they fell, even as her lips drooped with disappointment. And she sighed, for he was not looking. Manlike, Hot with the ardor of the chase, he was deaf and blind to all else. She saw that he had not even heard. Twice within the day she had forgotten herself, had overstepped the rigid bounds of her breeding in using his Christian name, and twice he had been oblivious to that token of their maturing understanding. So she sighed, and, sighing, smiled again, resting an elbow on the window-sill and flattening one small gloved hand against the frame for a brace against the jouncing of the hansom. It swept on with unabated speed, upstream beside the tawny reaches of the river, and for a time there was no speech between them. The while the girl lost consciousness of self and her most imminent peril, surrendering her being to the lingering sweetness of her long, dear thoughts. I've got a scheme, Kirkwood declared, so explosively that she caught her breath with the surprise of it. There's the Pless. They know me there, and my credit's good. When we shake them off, we can have the cabby take us to the hotel. I'll register and borrow from the management enough to pay our way to Chiltern, and the tolls for a cable to New York. 
I've a friend or two over home who would have let me want for a few miserable pounds. So you see, he explained boyishly, we're at the end of our troubles already. She said something inaudible, holding her face averted. He bent nearer to her, wondering. I didn't understand, he suggested. Still looking from him, I said you were very good to me, she said in a quavering whisper. Dorothy without his knowledge or intention before the fact, as instinctively as he made use of her given name, intimately, his strong fingers dropped and closed upon the little hand that lay beside him. "'What is the matter, dear?' He leaned still further forward to peer into her face, till glance met glance in the ending, and his racing pulses tightened with sheer delight of the human happiness in her glistening eyes. "'Dorothy, child!' don't worry so. No harm shall come to you. It's all working out. All working out right. Only have a little faith in me, and I'll make everything work out right, Dorothy. Gently, she freed her fingers. I wasn't, she told him, in a voice that quivered between laughter and tears. I wasn't worrying. I was... You wouldn't understand. Don't be afraid. I shall break down, or... or anything... I shan't, he reassured her. I know you're not that sort. Besides, you'd have no excuse. We're moving along famously. That cabby knows his business. In fact, that gentleman was minute by minute demonstrating his peculiar fitness for the task he had so cheerfully undertaken. The superior horsemanship of the London Hackney cabman needs no exploitation and he in whose hands rested the fate of the calendar treasure was peer of his compeers he was instant to advantage himself of every opening to forward his pliant craft quick to foresee the fortunes of the way and govern himself accordingly estimating with practised eye the precise moment when the police supervisor of traffic at the junction of parliament and bridge streets would see fit to declare a temporary blockade he so managed that his was the last vehicle to pass ere the official wand to ignore which involves a forfeited license was lifted and indeed so close was his calculation that he escaped only with a scowl and word of warning from the bobby a matter of no importance whatever, since his end was gained and the pursuing cab had been shut off by the blockade. In Calendar's driver, however, he had an adversary of abilities by no means to be despised. Precisely how the man contrived it is a question. That he made a detour by way of Derby Street is not improbable. Unpleasant as it may have been for Stryker and Calendar to find themselves in such close proximity to the yard, at all events, he evaded the block, and hardly had the chase swung across Bridge Street than the pursuer was nimbly clattering in its wake. Past the Houses of Parliament, through Old Palace Yard, with the Abbey on their left, they swung away into Abington Street, whence suddenly they dived into the maze of backways, great and mean, which lies to the south of Victoria. Doubling and twisting, now this way, now that, the driver tooled them through the intricate heart of this labyrinth, leading the pursuers a dance that Kirkwood thought calculated to dishearten and shake off the pursuit in the first five minutes. Yet always, peering back through the little peephole, he saw Calendar's cab pelting doggedly in their rear. A hundred yards behind, no more, no less, hanging on with indomitable grit and determination. By degrees they drew westwards, threading Pimlico into Chelsea, once dashing briefly down the Grosvenor Road, the Thames a tawny flood beyond the river wall. Children cheered them on, and policemen turned to stare, doubting whether they should interfere. Minutes rolled into tens, measuring out an hour, and still they hammered on, hunted and hunters, playing their game of hare and hounds through the highways and byways of those staid and aged quarters. In the leading cab there were few words spoken. Kirkwood and Dorothy alike sat spellbound with the fascination of the game. If it is conceivable that the fox enjoys his part in the day's sport, then they were enjoying themselves. Now one spoke, now another, chiefly in the clipped phraseology of excitement, as, We're gaining. Yes, think so. Or, 
we'll tire them out. Surely. They can't catch us, can they, Philip? Never in the world. But he spoke with a confidence that he himself did not feel. For hope as he would, he could never see that the distance between the two had been materially lessened or increased. Their horses seemed almost evenly matched. The sun was very low behind the houses of the Surrey side when Kirkwood became aware that the horse was flagging, though, as comparison determined, no more so than the one behind. In grave concern, the young man raised his hand, thrusting open the trap in the roof. Immediately, the square of darkling sky was eclipsed by the cabby's face. "'Yes, sir?' "'You had better drive as directly as you can to the Hotel Pless. Kirkwood called up. "'I'm afraid it's no use pushing your horse like this.' "'I'm sure of it, sir. "'E's a good oss, he is, but he can't keep going for hever. "'You know, sir?' "'I know. You've done very well. You've done your best.' "'Very good, sir. The Pless you said, sir?' Right. The trap closed. Two blocks farther, and their pace had so sensibly moderated that Kirkwood was genuinely alarmed. The pursuing cabby was lashing his animal without mercy, while it aren't no use by whippin' him, sir, dropped through the trap. He's doin' all he can. I understand. Despondent recklessness tightened Kirkwood's lips, and kindled an unpleasant light in his eyes. He touched his side pocket. Calendar's revolver was there. Dorothy should win away clear if, if he swung for it. He bent forward with the traveling bag in his hands. "'What are you going to do?' The girl's voice was very tremulous. "'Stand a chance. Take a losing hazard. Can you run? You're not too tired?' "'I can run. Perhaps not far. A little way, at least.' And will you do as I say? Her eyes met his, unwavering, bespeaking her implicit faith. Promise. I promise. We'll have to drop off in a minute. The horse won't last. They're in the same box. Well, I undertake to stand him off for a bit. You take the bag and run for it. Just as soon as I can convince them, I'll follow. But if there's any delay, you call the first cab you see and drive to the Pless. I'll join you there. He stood up, surveying the neighborhood. Behind him, the girl lifted her voice in protest. No, Philip, no. You've promised, he said sternly, eyes ranging the street. I don't care. I won't leave you. He shook his head in silent contradiction, frowning, but not frowning because of the girl's mutiny. He was a little puzzled by a vague impression and was striving to put it down for recognition but was so thoroughly bemused with fatigue and despair that only with great difficulty could he force his faculties to logical reasoning, his memory to respond to his call upon it. The hansom was traversing a street in old Brompton, a quaint, prim byway lined with dwellings singularly old-worldish, even for London. He seemed to know it subjectively, to have retained a memory of it from another existence, as the state setting of a vivid dream all forgotten, will sometimes recur with peculiar and exasperating intensity in broad daylight. The houses, with their sloping, red-tiled roofs, unexpected gables, spontaneous dormer windows, glass panes set in leaded frames, red-brick facades trimmed with green shutters and doorsteps of white stone, each sitting back, sedate and self-sufficient, in its trim dooryard fenced off from the public thoroughfare. All wore an aspect hauntingly familiar, and yet strange. A corner sign, remarked in passing, had named the spot Aspen Villas. Though he felt he knew the sound of those syllables as well as he did the name of the Pless, strive as he might, he failed to make them convey anything tangible to his intelligence. When had he heard of it? At what time had his errant footsteps taken him through this curious survival of eighteenth-century London? Not that it mattered when. It could have no possible bearing on the emergency. He really gave it little thought. The mental processes recounted were mostly subconscious, if none the less real. His objective attention was wholly preoccupied with the knowledge that Calendar's cab was drawing perilously near. And he was debating whether or not they should alight at once and try to make a better pace afoot, 
when the decision was taken wholly out of his hands. Blindly staggering on, wilted with weariness, the horse stumbled in the shafts and plunged forward on its knees. Quick as the driver was to pull it up, with a cruel jerk of the bits, Kirkwood was caught unprepared. Lurching against the dashboard, he lost his footing, grasped frantically at the unstable air, and went over, bringing up in a sitting position in the gutter, with a solid shock that jarred his very teeth. For a moment, dazed as he sat there blinking, by the time he got to his feet, the girl stood beside him, questioning him with keen solicitude. No, he gasped, not hurt, only surprised. Wait. Their cab had come to a complete standstill. Callender's was no more than twenty yards behind, and as Kirkwood caught sight of him, the fat adventurer was in the act of lifting himself ponderously out of the seat. Incontinently, the young man turned to the girl and forced the traveling bag into her hands. Run for it, he begged her. Don't stop to argue. You promised. Run. I'll come. Philip, she pleaded. Dorothy, he cried in torment. Perhaps it was his unquestionable distress that weakened her. Suddenly she yielded, with whatever reason. He was only hazily aware of the swish of her skirts behind him. He had no time to look round and see that she got away safely. He had only eyes and thoughts for Calendar and Stryker. They were both afoot now and running toward him, the one as awkward as the other, but neither yielding a jot of their malignant purpose. He held the picture of it oddly graphic in his memory for many a day thereafter, Calendar making directly for him his heavy-featured face a dull red with the exertion, his fat head dropped forward as if too heavy for his neck of a bull, his small eyes bright with anger, Stryker shying off at a discreet angle, evidently with the intention of devoting himself to the capture of the girl, the two cabs with their dejected screws at rest in the middle of the quiet, twilit street. He seemed even to see himself standing stockily prepared, hands in his coat pockets, his own head inclined with a suggestion of pugnacity. To this mental photograph another succeeds, of the same scene an instant later all as it had been before, their relative positions unchanged, save that Stryker and Calendar had come to a dead stop, and that Kirkwood's right arm was lifted and extended, pointing at the captain. So forgetful of self was he, that it required a moment's thought to convince him that he was really responsible for the abrupt transformation. Incredulously, he realized that he had drawn Calendar's revolver and pulled Stryker up short, in mid-stride, by the mute menace of it, as much as by the hoarse cry of warning. Stryker, not another foot! With this there chimed in Dorothy's voice, ringing bell-clear from a little distance, Philip! Like a flash he wheeled to add yet another picture to his mental gallery. Perhaps two score feet up the sidewalk, a gate stood open. Just outside it, a man of tall and slender figure, rigged out in a bizarre costume, consisting mainly of a flowered dressing gown and slippers, was waiting in an attitude of singular impassivity. Within it, pausing with a foot lifted to the doorstep, bag in hand, her head turned, as she looked back, was Dorothy. As he comprehended these essential details of the composition, the man in the flowered dressing gown raised a hand, beckoning to him in a manner as imperative as his accompanying words. Kirkwood, he saluted the young man in a clear and vibrant voice, put up that revolver and stop this foolishness. And, with a jerk of his head towards the doorway, in which Dorothy now waited, hesitant, come, sir, quickly. Kirkwood choked on a laugh that was half a sob. Brentwick, he cried, restoring the weapon to his pocket and running toward his friend. Of all happy accidents. You may call it that, retorted the elder man with a fleeting smile as Kirkwood slipped inside the dooryard. Come, he said, let's get into the house. But you said, I thought you went to Munich, stammered Kirkwood and so thoroughly impregnated was his mind with this understanding that it was hard for him to adjust his perceptions of the truth. "'I was detained by business,' responded Brentwick briefly. His gaze, weary and wistful behind his glasses, rested on the face of the girl on the threshold of his home, 
and the faint sensitive flush of her face deepened he stopped and honoured her with a bow that for all his fantastical attire would have graced a beau of an earlier decade will you be pleased to enter he suggested punctiliously my house such as it is is quite at your disposal and he added with a glance over his shoulder i fancy that a word or two may presently be passed which you would hardly care to hear dorothy's hesitation was but transitory kirkwood was reassuring her with a smile more like his wonted boyish grin than anything he had succeeded in conjuring up throughout the day her own smile answered it and with a murmured word of gratitude and a little half-timid, half-distant bow for Brentwick, she passed on into the hallway. Kirkwood lingered with his friend upon the door-stoop. Calendar, recovered from his temporary consternation, was already at the gate, bending over it, fat fingers fumbling with the latch, his round red face lifted to the house, darkly working with chagrin. From his threshold, watching him with a slight contradiction of the eyes, Brentwick hailed him in tones of cloying courtesy. "'Do you wish to see me, sir?' The fat adventurer faltered just within the gateway. Then, with a truculent swagger, "'I want my daughter,' he declared vociferously. Brentwick peered mildly over his glasses, first at Calendar, then at Kirkwood. His glance lingered a moment on the young man's honest eyes, and swung back to Calendar. "'My good man,' he said with sublime tolerance, "'will you be pleased to take yourself off?' To the devil, if you like, or shall I take the trouble to interest the police? He removed one fine and fragile hand from a pocket of the flowered dressing gown, long enough to jerk it significantly toward the nearest street corner. Thunderstruck, Calendar glanced hastily in the indicated direction. A blue-coated bobby was to be seen approaching with measured stride, diffusing upon the still evening air an impression of ineffably capable self-contentment. Calendar's fleshy lips parted and closed without a sound. They quivered. Beneath them quivered his assortment of graduated chins. His heavy and pendulous cheeks quivered, slowly empurpling with the dark tide of his apoplectic wrath. The close-clipped thatch of his iron-gray mustache even seemed to bristle like hairs upon the neck of a maddened dog. Beneath him his fat legs trembled, and indeed his whole huge carcass shook visibly in the stress of his restrained wrath. Suddenly, overwhelmed, he banged the gate behind him and waddled off to join the captain, who already, with praiseworthy native prudence, had fallen back upon their cab. From his coin of strategic advantage, the comfortable elevation of his box, Kirkwood's cabby, whose huge enjoyment of the adventurer's discomfiture had throughout been noisily demonstrative, entreated Calendar with lifted forefingers bland affability, and expressions of heartfelt sympathy. Keb, sir? Have a keb, sir. Do. Try a ride behind a real horse, sir. Don't you go on wasting time on him. A jerk of a derisive thumb singled out the other cabin. He aren't plying you fair, sir. I knows him. He's a artful guy deceiver, he is. Look at his horse, which it aren't. It's a style, that's what it is. Take a father's advice, sir, and next time your fairest darter runs away with the duke in disguise, chice him in a real keb, sir. Not a cheap imitation. Keb, sir? Garn, you art arted. Here he swooped upwards in a dizzy flight of vituperation best unrecorded. Calendar, beyond an absent-minded flirt of one hand behind his ear, as who should shoo away a buzzing insect, ignored him utterly. Suddenly, extracting money from his pocket, he paid off his driver, and, in company with Stryker, trudged in morose silence down the street. Brentwick touched Kirkwood's arm and drew him into the house. End of Chapter 17 Recording by William Tomko Chapter 18 of The Black Bag This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance Chapter 18 Adventure's Luck As the door closed, Kirkwood swung impulsively to Brentwick, with the brief uneven laugh of fine-drawn nerves. "'Good God, sir!' he cried. "'You don't know—' "'I can surmise,' interrupted the elder man, shrewdly. "'You turned up in the nick of time, for all the world like—' "'Harlequin popping through a stage trap?' "'No, an incarnation of the providence that watches over children and fools.' Brentwick dropped a calming hand upon his shoulder. "'Your simile seems singularly happy, Philip. Permit me to suggest that you join the child in my study.' He laughed quietly, with a slight nod toward an open door at the end of the hallway. "'For yourself, I'll be with you in one moment.' A faint, indulgent smile, lurking in the shadow of his white moustache, he watched the young man wheel and dart through the doorway. "'Young hearts,' he commented inaudibly, and a trace sadly. "'Youth.' Beyond the threshold of the study, Kirkwood paused, eager eyes searching its somber shadows for a sign of Dorothy. A long room and deep, it was lighted only by the circumscribed disk of illumination thrown on the central desk by a shaded reading lamp, and the flickering glow of a grate fire set beneath the mantle of a side wall. At the back, heavy velvet portieres cloaked the recesses of two long windows, closed jealously even against the twilight, aside from the windows doors and chimney-piece every foot of wall space was occupied by towering bookcases or by shelves crowded to the limit of their capacity with an amazing miscellany of objects of art the fruit of years of patient and discriminating collecting an exotic and heady atmosphere compounded of the faint and intangible exhalations of these insentient things fragrance of sandalwood myrrh and musk reminiscent whiffs of half-forgotten incense seemed to intensify the impression of gloomy richness and repose by the fireplace a little to one side stood dorothy one small foot resting on the brass fender her figure merging into the dusky background her delicate beauty gaining an effect of elusive and ethereal mystery in the waning and waxing ruddy glow upflung from the bedded coals. "'Oh, Philip!' she turned swiftly to Kirkwood with extended hands and a low broken cry. "'I'm so glad!' A trace of hysteria in her manner warned him, and he checked himself upon the verge of a too dangerous tenderness. "'There!' he said soothingly, letting her hands rest gently in his palms while he led her to a chair. We can make ourselves easy now. She sat down, and he released her hands with a reluctance less evident than actual. If ever I say another word against my luck— Who? inquired the girl, lowering her voice. Who is the gentleman in the flower dressing gown? Brentwick. George Sylvester Brentwick. An old friend. I've known him for years, ever since I came abroad. Curiously enough, however, this is the first time I've ever been here. I called once, but he wasn't in, a few days ago, the day we met. I thought the place looked familiar. Stupid of me. Philip, said the girl, with a grave face but a shaking voice, it was, she laughed provokingly. "'It was so funny, Philip. I don't know why I ran, when you told me to, but I did, and while I ran, I was conscious of the front door, here, opening, and this tall man in the flower dressing gown coming down to the gate as if it were the most ordinary thing in the world for him to stroll out, dressed that way, in the evening. And he opened the gate, and bowed, and said, ever so pleasantly, "'Won't you come in, Miss Callender?' "'He did!' exclaimed Kirkwood. "'But how—' "'How can I say?' she expostulated. "'At all events, he seemed to know me, "'and when he added something about calling you in, too, "'he said, Mr. Kirkwood, I didn't hesitate.' "'It's strange enough, surely, and fortunate. "'Bless his heart,' said Kirkwood. "'And 
Hum, said Mr. Brentwick considerably, entering the study. He had discarded the dressing gown and was now in evening dress. The girl rose. Kirkwood turned. Mr. Brentwick, he began. But Brentwick begged his patience with an eloquent gesture. Sir, he said, somewhat austerely, permit me to put a single question. Have you by any chance paid your cabby? Why, faltered the younger man, with a flaming face, I, why, no. That is, the other quietly put his hand upon a bell pull. A faint jingling sound was at once audible, emanating from the basement. How much should you say you owe him? I, I haven't a penny in the world. The shrewd eyes flashed their amusement into Kirkwood's. Tut, tut, Brent chuckled. Between gentlemen, my dear boy, dear me, you are slow to learn. I'll never be contented to sponge on my friends, explained Kirkwood, in deepest misery. I can't tell when. Tut, tut. How much did you say? Ten shillings, or, say, twelve, would be about right, stammered the American, swayed by conflicting emotions of gratitude and profound embarrassment. A soft-footed butler, impassive as fate, materialized mysteriously in the doorway. "'You rang, sir?' he interrupted frigidly. "'I rang, Watton.' His master selected a sovereign from his purse and handed it to the servant. "'For the cabby, Watton.' "'Yes, sir.' The butler swung automatically on one heel. "'And Watton?' "'Sir?' "'If anyone should ask for me, I'm not at home.' "'Very good, sir. "'And if you should see a pair of disreputable scoundrels skulking in the neighborhood, "'one short and stout, the other tall and evidently a seafaring man, let me know.' "'Thank you, sir.' A moment later the front door was heard to close. Brentwick turned with a little bow to the girl. "'My dear Miss Calendar,' he said, rubbing his thin, fine hands, I am old enough, I trust, to call you such without offense. Please be seated. Complying, the girl rewarded him with a radiant smile. Whereupon, striding to the fireplace, their host turned his back to it, clasped his hands behind him, and glowered benignly upon the two. Ah, he observed in accents of extreme personal satisfaction, romance, romance. "'Would you mind telling us how you knew?' began Kirkwood, anxiously. "'Not in the least, my dear Philip. It is simple enough. I possess an imagination. From my bedroom window, on the floor above, I happen to behold two cabs racing down the street, the one doggedly pursuing the other. The foremost stops, perforce of a fagged horse. There alights a young gentleman, looking, if you'll pardon me, uncommonly seedy. He is followed by a young lady, if she will pardon me, with another little bow, uncommonly pretty. With these two old eyes, I observe that the gentleman does not pay his cabby. Ergo, I intelligently deduce, he is short of money. Eh? You were right, affirmed Kirkwood, with a rueful and crooked smile. But— So, so— pursued Brentwick, rising on his toes and dropping back again. So this world of ours wags on to the old, old tune. And I, who in my younger days pursued adventure without success, in dotage find myself dragged into a romance by my two ears, whether I will or no, eh? And now you are going to tell me all about it, Philip. There is a chair. Well, Wadden? The butler had again appeared noiselessly in the doorway. "'Beg pardon, sir. They're waiting, sir.' "'The caitiffs, Wotan?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Where waiting?' "'One at each end of the street, sir.' "'Thank you. You may bring a sherry and biscuit, Wotan.' "'Thank you, sir.' The servant vanished. Brentwick removed his glasses, rubbed them, and blinked thoughtfully at the girl. "'My dear,' he said suddenly, with a peculiar tremor in his voice, "'you resemble your mother remarkably. "'Tut, I should know. "'Time was when I was one of her most ardent admirers.' "'You—you you, you knew my mother?' cried Dorothy, profoundly moved. 
Did I not know you at sight? My dear, you are your mother reincarnate, for the good of an unworthy world. She was a very beautiful woman, my dear. Woden entered with a silver serving tray, offering it in turn to Dorothy, Kirkwood, and his employer. While he was present, the three held silent. The girl trembling slightly, but with her face aglow, Kirkwood half stupefied between his ease from care and his growing astonishment, as Brentwick continued to reveal unexpected phases of his personality. Brentwick himself outwardly imperturbable and complacent, for all that his hand shook as he lifted his wine-glass. "'You may go, Walton, or wait. Don't you feel the need of a breath of fresh air, Wotan? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Then change your coat, Wotan, light your pipe, and stroll out for half an hour. You need not leave the street, but if either the tall, thin blackguard with the seafaring habit, or the short, stout rascal with the air of mystery should accost you, treat them with all courtesy, Wotan. You will be careful not to tell either of them anything in particular, although I don't mind your telling them that Mr. Brentwick lives here, if they ask. I am mostly concerned to discover if they propose becoming fixtures on the street corners, Wotan. Quite so, sir. Now you may go, Wotan, continued his employer, as the butler took himself off as softly as a cat. Grows daily a more valuable mechanism. He is by no means human in any respect, but I find him extremely handy to have round the house. And now, my dear, turning to Dorothy, with your permission, I desire to drink to the memory of your beautiful mother and to the happiness of her beautiful daughter. But you will tell me a number of interesting things, Miss Callender, if you'll be good enough to let me choose the time. I beg you to be patient with the idiosyncrasies of an old man, who means no harm, who has a reputation as an eccentric to sustain before his servants. And now, said Brentwick, setting aside his glass, now, my dear boy, for the adventure. Kirkwood chuckled, infected by his host's genial humor. How do you know? How can it be otherwise? countered Brentwick, with a trace of asperity. "'Am I to be denied my adventure? "'Sir, I refuse without equivocation. "'Your very bearing breathes of romance. "'There must be an adventure forthcoming, Philip. "'Otherwise, my disappointment will be so acute "'that I shall be regretfully obliged, seriously, "'to consider my right, as a householder, to show you the door.' "'But, Mr. Brentwick, sit down, sir.' commanded Brentwick, with such a peremptory note that the young man, who had risen, obeyed out of sheer surprise, upon which his host advanced, indicting him with a long white forefinger. "'Would you, sir,' he demanded, again expose this little lady to the machinations of that corpulent scoundrel whom I have just had the pleasure of shooing off my premises because you choose to resent an old man's raillery?' "'I apologize.' Kirkwood humored him. I accept the apology in the spirit in which it is offered. I repeat. Now, for the adventure, Philip, if the story's long, epitomize. We can consider details more at our leisure. Kirkwood's eyes consulted the girl's face. Almost imperceptibly, she nodded him permission to proceed. Briefly, then, he began haltingly, the man who followed us to the door here is Miss Callender's father. Oh, his name, please. George Burgoyne Callender. Ah, an American. I remember now. Continue, please. He is hounding us, sir, with the intention of stealing some property which he caused to be stolen, which we, to put it bluntly, stole from him, to which he has no shadow of a title, and which, finally, we're endeavoring to return to its owners. My dear interpolated Brentwick gently, looking down at the girl's flushed face and drooping head. "'He ran us to the last ditch,' Kirkwood continued. "'I've spent my last farthing trying to lose him.' "'But why have you not caused his arrest?' Brentwick inquired. Kirkwood nodded meaningly toward the girl. Brentwick made a sound indicating comprehension, a click of the tongue behind closed teeth. "'We came to your door by the merest accident.' 
It might as well have been another. I understood you were in Munich, and it never entered my head that we'd find you home. A communication from my solicitors detained me, explained Brentwick. And now, what do you intend to do? Trespass as far on your kindness as you'll permit. In the first place, I... I want the use of a few pounds with which to cable some friends in New York, for money, on receipt of which I can repay you. Philip, observed Brentwood, you are a most irritating child, but I forgive you the faults of youth. You may proceed, bearing in mind, if you please, that I am your friend equally with any you may own in America. You're one of the best men in the world, said Kirkwood. Tut, tut! Will you get on? Secondly, I want you to help us to escape Calendar tonight. It is necessary that Miss Calendar should go to Chiltern this evening, where she has friends who will receive and protect her. Mm-hmm, grumbled their host, meditative. My faith, he commented, with brightening eyes. It sounds almost too good to be true and i've been growing afraid that the world was getting to be a most humdrum and uninteresting planet miss calendar i am a widower of so many years standing that i had almost forgotten i had ever been anything but a bachelor i fear my house contains little that will be of service to a young lady yet a room is at your disposal the parlour-maid will show you the way and, Philip, between you and me, I venture to remark that hot water and cold steel would add to the attractiveness of your personal appearance. My valet will attend you in my room. Dinner, concluded Brentwick with anticipative relish, will be served in precisely thirty minutes. I shall expect you to entertain me with a full and itemized account of every phase of your astonishing adventure. Later, we will find a way to Chiltern. Again, he put a hand upon the bell pull. Simultaneously, Dorothy and Kirkwood rose. Mr. Brentwick, said the girl, her eyes starred with tears of gratitude. I don't, I really don't know how. My dear, said the old gentleman, you will thank me most appropriately by continuing, to the best of your ability, to resemble your mother more remarkably every minute. But I, began Kirkwood, you, my dear Philip, can thank me best by permitting me to enjoy myself, which I am doing thoroughly at the present moment. My pleasure in being invited to interfere in your young affairs is more keen than you can well surmise. Moreover, said Mr. Brentwick, so long have I been an amateur adventurer that I esteem it the rarest privilege to find myself thus on the point of graduating into professional ranks. He rubbed his hands, beaming upon them, and, he added, as a maid appeared at the door, I have already schemed to me a scheme for the discomfiture of our friends, the enemy, a scheme which we will discuss with our dinner, while the heathen rage and imagine a vain thing in the outer darkness. Kirkwood would have lingered, but of such inflexible temper was his host that he bowed him into the hands of a man-servant without permitting him another word. "'Not a syllable,' he insisted. "'I protest I am devoured with curiosity, my dear boy, but I have also bowels of compassion. When we are well on with our meal, when you are strengthened with food and drink, then you may begin. But now, Dicky, to the valet, do your duty. Kirkwood, laughing with exasperation, retired at discretion, leaving Brentwick the master of the situation, a charming gentleman with a will of his own and a way that went with it. He heard the young man's footsteps diminish on the stairway, and again he smiled the indulgent, melancholy smile of mellow years. Youth, he whispered softly, romance, and now, with a brisk change of tone as he closed the study door, now we are ready for this interesting Mr. Calendar. Sitting down at his desk, he found and consulted a telephone directory, but its leaves, at first rustling briskly at the touch of the slender and delicate fingers, were presently permitted to lie unturned. The book, resting open on his knees, the while he stared wistfully into the fire. A suspicion of moisture glimmered in his eyes. Dorothy, 
he whispered huskily. And a little later, rising, he proceeded to the telephone. An hour and a half later, Kirkwood, his self-respect something restored by a bath, a shave, and a resumption of clothes which had been hastily but thoroughly cleansed and pressed by Brentwick's valet, his confidence and courage mounting high under the combined influence of generous wine, substantial food, the presence of his heart's mistress, and the admiration, which was unconcealed, of his friend, concluded at the dinner-table his narration. And that, he said, looking up from his savory, is about all. Bravo! applauded Brentwick, eyes shining with delight. All, interposed Dorothy in warm reproach. But what he hasn't told, which, my dear, is to be accounted for wholly by a very creditable modesty, rarely encountered in the young men of the present day. It was, of course, altogether different with those of my younger years. Yes, Wotan? Brentwick sat back in his chair, inclining an attentive ear to a communication murmured by the butler. Kirkwood's gaze met Dorothy's across the expanse of shining cloth. He deprecated her interruption with a whimsical twist of his eyebrows. Really, you shouldn't, he assured her in an undertone. I've done nothing to deserve. But under the spell of her serious sweet eyes, he fell silent, and presently looked down, strangely abashed, and contemplated the vast enormity of his unworthiness. Coffee was set before them by Wotan, the impassive, Brentwick refusing it with a little sigh. "'It is one of the things, as Philip knows,' he explained to the girl, "'denied me by the physician who makes his life happy by making mine a waste. I am allowed but three luxuries, cigars, travel in moderation, and the privilege of imposing on my friends. The first I propose presently, to enjoy by your indulgence and the second I shall this evening undertake by virtue of the third, of which I have just availed myself. Smiling at the involution, he rested his head against the back of his chair, eyes roving from the girl's face to Kirkwood's. Inspiration to do which, he proceeded gravely, came to me from the seafaring Picaroon. Stryker, did you name him? Via the excellent Wotan, while you were preparing for dinner, Wotan returned from his constitutional with the news that, leaving the corpulent person on watch at the corner, Captain Stryker had temporarily made himself scarce. However, we need feel no anxiety concerning his whereabouts, for he reappeared in good time and a motor car, from which it becomes evident that you have not overrated their pertinacity. The fiasco of the cab chase is not to be reenacted. Resolutely, the girl repressed a gasp of dismay. Kirkwood stared moodily into his cup. "'These men bore me fearfully,' he commented at last. "'And so,' continued Brentwick, "'I bethought me of a counter-stroke. "'It is my good fortune to have a friend "'whose whim it is to support a touring car, "'chiefly in innocuous idleness. "'Accordingly, I have telephoned him "'and commandeered the use of this machine.' Mechanician, too. Though not a betting man, I am willing to risk recklessly a few pence in support of my contention that of the two, Captain Stryker's car and ours, the latter will prove considerably the most speedy. In short, I suggest, he concluded, thoughtfully lacing his long white fingers, that avoiding the hazards of cab and railway carriage, we motor to Chiltern the night being fine, and the road, I am told, exceptionally good. Miss Dorothy, what do you think? Instinctively the girl looked to Kirkwood, then shifted her glance to their host. I think you are wonderful, thoughtful, and kind, she said simply. And you, Philip? It's an inspiration, the younger man declared. I can't think of anything better calculated to throw them off than to distance them by motor car. It would be always possible to trace our journey by rail. Then, announced Brentwick, making as if to rise, we had best go. If neither my hearing nor Captain Stryker's car deceives me, our fiery chariot is panting at the door. 
a little sobered from the confident spirit of quiet gaiety in which they had dined, they left the table. Not that, in their hearts, either greatly questioned their ultimate triumph, but they were allowing for the element of error so apt to set at naught human calculations. Calendar himself had already been proved fallible. Within the bounds of possibility, their turn to stumble might now be imminent. When he let himself dwell upon it, their utter helplessness to give Calendar pause by commonplace methods maddened Kirkwood. With another scoundrel, it had been so simple a matter to put a period to his activities by a word to the police. But he was her father. For that reason, he must continually be spared even though, in desperate extremity, she should give consent to the arrest of the adventurers, retaliation would follow, swift and sure. For they might not overlook nor gloze the fact that hers had been the hands responsible for the theft of the jewels. Innocent though she had been in committing that larceny, a cat's paw, guided by an intelligence unscrupulous and malign, the law would not hold her guiltless were she once brought within its cognizance nor possibly would the Hallams, mother and son. Upon their knowledge and their fear of this, undoubtedly Calendar was reckoning. Witness the barefaced effrontery with which he operated against them. His fear of the police might be genuine enough, but he was never for an instant disturbed by any doubt lest his daughter should turn against him. She would never dare that before they left the house while dorothy was above stairs resuming her hat and coat kirkwood and brentwick reconnoitered from the drawing-room windows themselves screened from observation by the absence of light in the room behind before the door a motor-car waited engines humming impatiently mechanician ready in his seat an uncouth shape in goggles and leather garments that shone like oilskins under the street lights at one corner another and a smaller car stood in waiting its lamps like a baleful eyes glaring through the night in the shadows across the way a lengthy shadow lurked stryker beyond reasonable question otherwise the street was deserted not even that adventitious bobby of the early evening was now in evidence dorothy presently joining them brentwick led the way to the door Wotan, apparently nerveless beneath his absolute immobility, let them out, and slammed the door behind them with such promptitude as to give cause for the suspicion that he was a fraud, a sham, beneath his icy exterior, desperately afraid lest the house be stormed by the adventurers. Kirkwood to the right, Brentwick to the left of Dorothy, the former carrying the treasure bag, they hastened down the walk and through the gate to the car. The watcher across the way was moved to whistle shrilly. The other car lunged forward nervously. Brentwick, taking the front seat beside the mechanician, left the tonneau to Kirkwood and Dorothy. As the American slammed the door, the car swept smoothly out into the middle of the way, while the pursuing car swerved into the other curb, slowing down to let Stryker jump aboard. Kirkwood put himself in the seat by the girl's side, and for a few moments was occupied with the arrangement of the robes. Then, sitting back, he found her eyes fixed upon him, pools of inscrutable night in the shadow of her hat. "'You aren't afraid, Dorothy?' she answered quietly. "'I am with you, Philip.' Beneath the robe, their hands met. Exalted, excited, he turned and looked back. A hundred yards to the rear, four unwinking eyes trailed them, like some modern nemesis in monstrous guise. End of chapter 18 Recording by William Tomko Chapter 19, Part 1 of The Black Bag This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance. Chapter 19. Part 1. The Uxbridge Road. 
At a steady gait, now and again checked in deference to the street traffic, Brentwick's motor-car rolled, with resonant humming of the engine, down the Cromwell Road, swerved into Warwick Road, and swung northward through Kensington to Shepherd's Bush. Behind it, Calendar's car clung as if towed by an invisible cable, never gaining, never losing, mutely testifying to the adventurer's unrelenting, grim determination to leave them no instant's freedom from surveillance, to keep forever at their shoulders, watching his chance, biding his time with sinister patience until the moment when, wearied, their vigilance should relax. To some extent, he reckoned without his motor-car. As long as they travelled within the metropolitan limits, constrained to observe a decorous pace in view of the prejudices of the county council, it was a matter of no difficulty whatever to maintain his distance. But once they had won through Shepherd's Bush, and, paced by huge double-decked trolley trams, were flying through Hammersmith on the Uxbridge Road, once they had run through Act, and knew beyond dispute that now they were without the city boundaries, then the complexion of the business was suddenly changed. Not too soon for honest sport. Calendar was to have, Kirkwood would have said in lurid American idiom, a run for his money. The scattered lights of Southall were winking out behind them before Brentwick chose to give the word to the mechanician. Quietly, the latter threw in the clutch for the third speed, and the fourth. The car leaped forward like a startled racehorse. The motor lilted merrily into its deep-throated song of the open road, its contented silken humming passing into a sonorous and sustained purr. Kirkwood and the girl were first jarred violently forward, then thrown together. She caught his arm to steady herself. It seemed the most natural thing imaginable that he should take her hand and pass it beneath his arm, holding her so, his fingers closed above her own. Before they had recovered, or had time to catch their breath, a mile of Middlesex had dropped to the rear. Not quite so far had they distanced Calendar's trailing nemesis of the four glaring eyes, the pursuers put forth a gallant effort to hold their place. At intervals during the first few minutes, a heavy roaring and crashing could be heard behind them. Gradually, it subsided, dying on the wings of the free-rushing wind that buffeted their faces as mile after mile was reeled off and the wide, darkling English countryside opened out before them, sweet and wonderful. Once Kirkwood looked back, in the winking of an eye, he saw four faded disks of light, pallid with despair top a distant rise, and glide down into darkness. When he turned, Dorothy was interrogating him with eyes whose melting, shadowed loveliness revealed to him in the light of the far, still stars seemed to incite him to that madness which he had bade himself resist with all his strength. He shook his head, as if to say, They cannot catch us. His hour was not yet time enough to think of love and marriage, as if he were capable of consecutive thought on any other subject, time enough to think of them when he had gone back to his place, or rather, when he should have found it, in the ranks of breadwinners, and so have proved his right to mortal happiness, time enough then to lay whatever he might have to offer at her feet. Now he could conceive of no baser treachery to his soul's desire than to advantage himself of her gratitude. Resolutely, he turned his face forward, striving with all his will and might to forget the temptation of her lips, weary as they were and petulant with waiting, and so sat rigid in his time of trial, clinging with what strength he could to the standards of his honor, and trying to lose his dream in dreaming of the bitter struggle that seemed likely to be his future portion. Perhaps she guessed a little of the fortunes of the battle that was being waged, within him. Perhaps not. Whatever the trend of her thoughts, she did not draw away from him. Perhaps the breath of night, fresh and clean and fragrant with the odor of the fields and hedges, sweeping into her face with velvety caress, rendered her drowsy. Presently the silken lashes drooped, fluttering upon her cheeks. The tired and happy smile hovered above her lips. 
In something less than half an hour of this wild driving, Kirkwood roused out of his reverie sufficiently to become sensible that the speed was slackening. Incoherent snatches of sentences, fragments of words and phrases spoken by Brentwick and the mechanician, were flung back past his ears by the rushing wind. Shielding his eyes, he could see dimly that the mechanician was tinkering, apparently, with the driving gear. Then, their pace continuing steadily to abate, he heard Brentwick fling at the man a sharp-toned and querulously impatient question. What was the trouble? His reply came in a single word, not distinguishable. The girl sat up, opening her eyes, disengaging her arm. Kirkwood bent forward and touched Brentwick on the shoulder. The latter turned to him, a face lined with deep concern. Trouble, he announced superfluously. I fear we have blundered. What is it? asked Dorothy in a troubled voice. Petrol seems to be running low. Charles here, he referred to the mechanician, says the tank must be leaking. We'll go on as best we can and try to find an inn. Fortunately, most of the inns nowadays keep supplies of petrol for just such emergencies. Are we? Do you think? Oh, no, not a bit of danger of that, returned Brentwick hastily. They'll not catch up with us this night. That is a very inferior car they have. So, Charles says, at least nothing to compare with this. If I'm not in error, there's the crown and mitre just ahead. We'll make it fill our tanks, and be off again before they can make up half their loss. Dorothy looked anxiously to Kirkwood, her lips forming an unuttered query. What did he think? Don't worry, we'll have no trouble, he assured her stoutly. The chauffeur knows, undoubtedly. Nonetheless, he was moved to stand up in the tonneau, conscious of the presence of the traveling bag snug between his feet as well as the weight of calendar's revolver in his pocket while he stared back along the road there was nothing to be seen of their persecutors the car continued to crawl five minutes dragged out tediously gradually they drew abreast a tavern standing back a distance from the road embowered in a grove of trees between whose anxious boles the taproom windows shone enticingly aglow with comfortable light. A creaking signboard, much worn by weather and age, swinging from a roadside post, confirming the accuracy of Brentwick's surmise, announcing that here stood the Crown and Mitre, house of entertainment for man and beast. Sluggishly, the car rolled up before it and came to a dead and silent halt. Charles, the mechanician, jumping out, ran hastily up the path towards the inn. In the car, Brentwick turned again, his eyes curiously bright in the starlight, his forehead quaintly furrowed, his voice apologetic. It may take a few minutes, he said undecidedly, plainly endeavoring to cover up his own dark doubts. My dear, to the girl, if I have brought trouble upon you in this wise, I shall never earn my own forgiveness. Kirkwood stood up again, watchful, attentive to the sounds of night but the voice of the pursuing motor-car was not of their company. "'I hear nothing,' he announced. "'You will forgive me, won't you, my dear, for causing you these few moments of needless anxiety,' pleaded the old gentleman, his tone tremulous. "'As if you could be blamed,' protested the girl. "'You mustn't think of it that way. Fancy, what should we have done without you?' "'I'm afraid I have been very clumsy,' sighed Brentwick clumsy and impulsive kirkwood do you hear anything not yet sir perhaps suggested brentwick a little later perhaps we had better alight and go up to the inn it would be more cozy there especially if the petrol proves hard to obtain and we have long to wait i should like that assented the girl decidedly kirkwood nodded his approval opened the door and jumped out to assist her then picked up the bag and followed the pair, Brentwick leading the way with Dorothy on his arm. At the doorway of the Crown and Mitre, Charles met them evidently seriously disturbed. "'No petrol to be had here, sir,' he announced reluctantly. "'But the landlord will send to the next inn, a mile up the road, for some. You will have to be patient, I'm afraid, sir.' 
"'Very well. Get someone to help you push the car in from the road,' ordered Brentwick. "'We will be waiting in one of the private parlors.' "'Yes, sir. Thank you, sir.' The mechanician touched the visor of his cap and hurried off. "'Come, Kirkwood.' Gently, Brentwick drew the girl in with him. Kirkwood lingered momentarily on the doorstep, to listen acutely, but the wind was blowing into that quarter whence they had come, and he could hear naught save the soughing of the trees, together with an occasional burst of rude rustic laughter from the tap-room. Lifting his shoulders in dumb dismay, and endeavoring to compose his features, he entered the tavern. End of chapter 19, part 1 Recording by William Tomko Chapter 19, Part 2 of The Black Bag This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance Chapter 19, Part 2, The Crown and Mitre a rosy-cheeked and beaming landlady met him in the corridor, and, all bows and smiles, ushered him into a private parlor reserved for the party, immediately bustling off in a desperate flurry to secure refreshments desired by Brentwick. The girl had seated herself on one end of an extremely comfortless lounge, and was making a palpable effort to seem at ease. Brentwick stood at one of the windows, shoulders rounded and head bent, hands clasped behind his back as he peered out into the night. Kirkwood dropped the traveling bag beneath a chair, the farthest removed from the doorway, and took to pacing the floor. In a corner of the room a tall grandfather's clock ticked off ten interminable minutes. For some reason unconscionably delaying, the landlady did not reappear. Brentwick, abruptly turning from the window, remarked the fact querulously, then drew a chair up to a marble-topped table in the middle of the floor. "'My dear,' he requested the girl, "'will you oblige me by sitting over here? And, Philip, bring up a chair, if you will. We must not permit ourselves to worry, and I have something here which may, perhaps, engage your interest for a while.' To humor him and alleviate his evident distress of mind, they acceded. Kirkwood found himself seated opposite Dorothy, Brentwick between them. After some hesitation, made the more notable by an air of uneasiness which sat oddly on his shoulders, whose composure and confident mien had theretofore been so complete and so reassuring, the elder gentleman fumbled in an inner coat pocket and brought to light a small black leather wallet. He seemed to be on the point of opening it, when hurried footfalls sounded in the hallway. Brentwick placed the wallet, still with its secret intact, on the table before him, as Charles burst unceremoniously in, leaving the door wide open. "'Mr. Brentwick, sir!' he cried gustily. "'That other car!' With a smothered ejaculation, Kirkwood leaped to his feet, tugging at the weapon in his pocket. In another instant he had the revolver exposed. The girl's cry of alarm, interrupting the machinist, fixed Brentwick's attention on the young man. He too stood up, reaching over very quickly to clamp strong, supple fingers round Kirkwood's wrist, while with the other hand he laid hold of the revolver and by a single twist wrenched it away. Kirkwood turned upon him in fury. So, he cried, shaking with passion, this is what your hospitality meant. You're going to... "'My dear young friend,' interrupted Brentwick, with a flash of impatience, "'remember that if I had designed to betray you, "'I could have asked no better opportunity "'than when you were my guest under my own roof.' "'But hang it all, Brentwick,' expostulated Kirkwood, "'ashamed and contrite, but worked upon by desperate apprehension. "'I didn't mean that, but—' "'Would you have bullets flying when she is near?' "'demanded Brentwick scathingly. Hastily, he slipped the revolver upon a little shelf beneath the table-top. "'Sir,' he informed Kirkwood with some heat, "'I love you as my own son, but you're a young fool, as I have been in my time, and as I would to heaven I might be again. 
Be advised, Philip. Be calm. Can't you see it's the only way to save your treasure? Hang the jewels, retorted Kirkwood warmly. What? Sir, who said anything about the jewels? As Brentwick spoke, Calendar's corpulent figure filled the doorway. Stryker's weather-worn features loomed over his shoulder, distorted in a cheerful leer. "'As to the jewels,' announced the fat adventurer, "'I've got a word to say, if you put it to me that way.' He paused on the threshold, partly for dramatic effect, partly for his own satisfaction, his quick eyes darting from face to face of the four people whom he had caught so unexpectedly. A shade of complacency colored his expression, and he smiled evilly beneath the coarse short thatch of his gray mustache. In his hand a revolver appeared, poised for immediate use if there were need. There was none. Brentwick, at his primal appearance, had dropped a peremptory hand on Kirkwood's shoulder, forcing the young man back to his seat. At the same time he resumed his own. The girl had not stirred from hers since the first alarm. She sat as if transfixed with terror, leaning forward with her elbows on the table her hands tightly clasped, her face, a little blanched, turned to the door. But her scarlet lips were set and firm with inflexible purpose, and her brown eyes met Calendar's with a look level and unflinching. Beyond this she gave no sign of recognition. Nearest of the four to the adventurers was Charles. The mechanician paused in affrighted astonishment at sight of the revolver. Calendar, choosing to advance suddenly, poked the muzzle of the weapon jocularly in the man's ribs. "'Beat it, four eyes!' he snapped. "'This is your cue to duck. Get out of my way!' The mechanician jumped as if shot, then hastily retreated to the table, his sallow features working beneath the goggle mask which had excited the fat adventurer's scorn. "'Come right in, Captain!' Calendar threw over one shoulder. Come in, shut the door, and lock it. Let's all be sociable and have a nice, quiet time. Stryker obeyed with a derisive grimace for Kirkwood. Calendar, advancing jauntily to a point within a yard of the table, stopped, smiling affably down upon his prospective victims, and airily twirling his revolver. Good evening, all, he saluted them blandly. Dorothy! "'My child,' with assumed concern, "'you're looking a trifle upset. "'I'm afraid you've been keeping late hours. "'Little girls must be careful, you know, "'or they lose the bloom of roses in their cheeks. "'Mr. Kirkwood, it's a pleasure to meet you again. "'Permit me to paraphrase your most sound advice "'and remind you that pistol shots "'are apt to attract undesirable attention. "'It wouldn't be wise for you to bring the police about our ears.' I believe that in substance such was your sapient counsel to me in the cabin of the Althea, was it not? And you, sir, fixing Brentwick with a cold, unfriendly eye, you animated fossil, what do you mean by telling me to go to the devil? But let that pass. I hold no grudge. What might your name be? It might be Brentwick, said that gentleman placidly. Brentwick, eh? Well, I like a man of spirit, but permit me to advise you. Gladly, nodded Brentwick. Eh? Don't come a second time between father and daughter. Another man might not be as patient as I, Mr. Brentwick. There's a law in the land, if you don't happen to know it. I congratulate you on your success in evading it, observed Brentwick, undisturbed, and it was considerate of you not to employ it in this instance. Then, with a sharp change of tone, "'Come, sir,' he demanded, "'you have unwarrantably intruded in this room, "'which I have engaged for my private use. "'Get through with your business, and be off with you. "'All in my good time, my antediluvian friend. "'When I've found up my business here, I'll go. "'Not before. "'But, just to oblige you, we'll get down to it. "'Kirkwood, you have a revolver of mine.' Be good enough to return it. I have it here, under the table, interrupted Brentwick suavely. Shall I hand it to you? By the muzzle, if you please. Be very careful. This one's loaded, too. Apt to explode any minute. 
To Kirkwood's intense disgust, Brentwick quietly slipped one hand beneath the table and, placing the revolver on its top, delicately, with his fingertips, shoved it toward the farther edge. With a grunt of approval, Calendar swept the weapon up and into his pocket. "'Any more ordinance?' he inquired briskly, eyes moving alertly from face to face. "'No matter. You wouldn't dare use him anyway. And I'm about done.' "'Dorothy, my dear, it's high time you return to your father's protection. "'Where's that Gladstone bag?' "'In my traveling bag,' the girl told him in a toneless voice. "'Then you may bring it along. "'You may also say good night to the kind gentleman.' "'Dorothy did not move. "'Her pallor grew more intense, "'and Kirkwood saw her knuckles tighten beneath the gloves. "'Otherwise her mouth seemed to grow more straight and hard. "'Dorothy!' cried the adventurer with a touch of displeasure. "'You heard me?' "'I heard you,' she replied a little wearily, more than a little contemptuously. "'Don't mind him, please, Mr. Kirkwood.' With an appealing gesture, as Kirkwood, unable to contain himself, moved restlessly in his chair, threatening to rise. "'Don't say anything. I have no intention whatever of going with this man.' Calendar's features twitched nervously. He chewed a corner of his moustache, fixing the girl with a black stare. "'I presume,' he remarked after a moment, with slow deliberation, "'you are aware that, as your father, I am in a position to compel you to accompany me.' "'I shall not go with you,' iterated Dorothy in a level tone. "'You may threaten me, but I shall not go. Mr. Brentwick and Mr. Kirkwood are taking me to—' friends, who will give me a home until I find a way to take care of myself. That is all I have to say to you. "'Bravo, my dear!' cried Brentwick encouragingly. "'Mind your business, sir!' thundered Calendar, his face darkening. Then to Dorothy, "'You understand, I trust, what this means?' he demanded. "'I offer you a home, and a good one. Refuse, and you work for your living, my girl. You've forfeited your legacy.' "'I know, I know,' she told him in cold disdain. "'I am content. Won't you be kind enough to leave me alone?' For a breath, Calendar glowered over her. Then, "'I presume,' he observed, "'that all these heroics are inspired by that whippersnapper Kirkwood. "'Do you know that he hasn't a brass farthing to bless himself with?' "'What has that?' cried the girl indignantly. "'Why, it has everything to do with me, my child. "'As your doting parent, I can't consent to your marrying nothing a year. "'For I surmise you intend to marry this, Mr. Kirkwood, don't you?' "'There followed a little interval of silence, "'while the warm blood flamed in the girl's face, "'and the red lips trembled as she faced her tormentor. "'Then, with a quaver that escaped her control, "'If Mr. Kirkwood asks me, I shall.' she stated very simply. That, interposed Kirkwood, is completely understood. His gaze sought her eyes, but she looked away. You forget that I am your father, sneered Calendar, and that you are a minor. I can refuse my consent. But you won't, Kirkwood told him with assurance. The adventurer stared. No, he agreed, after slight hesitation. No, I shan't interfere. "'Take her, my boy, if you want her, and a father's blessing into the bargain. "'The Lord knows I've troubles enough. "'A parent's lot is not what it's cracked up to be.' "'He paused, leering, ironic. "'But, deliberately, there's still this matter of the Gladstone bag. "'I don't mind abandoning my parental authority when my child's happiness is concerned. "'But as for my property—' "'It is not your property,' interrupted the girl. "'It was your mother's, dear child. It's now mine.' "'I dispute that assertion,' Kirkwood put in. "'You may dispute it till the cows come home, my boy. "'The fact will remain that I intend to take my property with me "'when I leave this room, whether you like it or not. "'Now, are you disposed to continue the argument, "'or may I count on your being sensible?' "'You may put away your revolver, if that's what you mean,' said Kirkwood. "'We certainly shan't oppose you with violence. "'But I warn you that Scotland Yard—' "'Oh, that be blowed!' the adventurer snorted in disgust. "'I can sail circles round any tech that ever blew out of Scotland Yard. "'Give me an hour's start, and you're free to do all the funny business you've a mind to with 
Scotland Yard. Then you admit, queried Brentwick civilly, that you've no legal title to the jewels in dispute? Look here, my friend, chuckled Calendar. When you catch me admitting anything, you write it down in your little book and tell the bobby on the corner. Just at present I've got other business than to stand round admitting anything about anything. Captain, let's have that bag of my dutiful daughter's. "'Ere you are,' Stryker spoke for the first time since entering the room, taking the valise from beneath the chair and depositing it on the table. "'Well, we shan't take anything that doesn't belong to us,' laughed Calendar, fumbling with the catch. "'Not even so small a matter as my own child's traveling bag. "'A small, heavy, gladstone bag,' he grunted, opening the valise, and pledging in one greedy hand, "'will just about do for mine.' with which he produced the article mentioned. "'This for the discard, Captain,' he laughed contentedly, pushing the girl's valise aside, and, rumbling with stentorian mirth, stood beaming benignantly over the assembled company. "'Why,' he exclaimed, "'this moment is worth all it cost me. My children, I forgive you freely. Mr. Cookwood, I felicitate you cordially on having secured a most expensive wife. Really?' Do you know, I feel as if I ought to do a little something for you both. Gurgling with delight, he smote his fat palms together. I just tell you what, he resumed, no one yet ever called Georgie Callender a tightwad. I just believe I'm going to make you kids a handsome wedding present. The good Lord knows there's enough of this for a fellow to be a little generous and never miss it. The thick model fingers tore nervously at the catch. Eventually he got the bag open. Those about the table bent forward, all quickened by the prospect of, for the first time, beholding the treasure over which they had fought, for which they had suffered so long. A heady and luscious fragrance pervaded the atmosphere, exhaling from the open mouth of the bag. A silence, indefinitely sustained, impressed itself upon the little audience. A breathless pause ended eventually by a short snap of Calendar's teeth. Hmm grunted the adventurer in bewilderment. He began to pant. Abruptly, his heavy hands delved into the contents of the bag, like the paws of a terrier digging in earth. To Kirkwood, the air seemed temporarily thick with flying objects. Beneath his astonished eyes, a towel fell upon the table, a crumpled, soiled towel, bearing on its dingy hem the inscription in indelible ink, Hotel du Commerce Anvers. A tooth-mug of substantial earthenware dropped to the floor with a crash. A slimy soap-dish of the same manufacture slid across the table and into Brentwick's lap. A battered alarm clock, with never a tick left in its abused carcass, rang vacuously as it fell by the open bag. The remainder was oranges, a dozen or more small, round, golden globes of ripe fruit, perhaps a shade overripe, therefore the more aromatic. The adventurer ripped out an oath. Mulready, by the living God, he raged in fury, done up, I swear, done by that infernal sneak, me, blind as a bat. He fell suddenly silent, the blood congesting in his face, as suddenly broke forth again, haranguing the company. That's why he went out and bought those damned oranges, is it? Think of it, me sitting in the hotel in Antwerp, and him lugging in oranges by the bag full because he was found of fruit. When did he do it? How do I know? If I knew, would I be here, and him the devil knows where, this minute? When my back was turned, of course, the damned snake. That's why he was so hot about picking a fight on the boat, eh? Wanted to get thrown off and take to the woods, leaving me with this and that's why he felt so awful done up he wouldn't take a hand at hunting you two down, eh? Well, by the eternal, I'll camp on his trail for the rest of his natural-born days. I'll have his eye-teeth for this. I'll... He swayed, gibbering with rage, his countenance frightfully contorted, his fat hands shaking as he struggled for expression. And then, while yet their own astonishment held Dorothy, Kirkwood, Brentwick, and Stryker speechless, Charles, the mechanician, moved suddenly upon the adventurer. There followed two metallic clicks. Calendar's ravings were abrupted, as if his tongue had been paralyzed. 
He fell back a pace, flabby jowls pale and shaking, ponderous jaw dropping on his breast, mouth wide and eyes crazed as he shook violently before him his thick, fleshy wrists, securely handcuffed. Simultaneously, the mechanician whirled about, bounded eagerly across the floor, and caught Stryker at the door, his dexterous fingers twisting in the captain's collar as he jerked him back and tripped him. "'Mr. Kirkwood,' he cried, "'here, please, one moment. Take this man's gun from him, will you?' Kirkwood sprang to his assistance, and without encountering much trouble, succeeded in wresting a Webley from Stryker's limp, flaccid fingers." Roughly, the mechanician shook the man, dragging him to his feet. Now, he ordered sternly, you march to that corner, stick your nose in it, and be good. You can't get away if you try. I've got other men outside, waiting for you to come out. Understand? Trembling like a whipped cur, Stryker meekly obeyed his instructions to the letter. The mechanician, with a contemptuous laugh leaving him, strode back to Calendar meanwhile whipping off his goggles, and clapped a hearty hand upon the adventurer's quaking shoulders. "'Well,' he cried, "'and are you still sailing circles round the men from Scotland Yard, Simmons, or Bellows, or Sanderson, or Callender, or Crumstone, or whatever name you prefer to sail under?' Callender glared at him aghast, then heaved a profound sigh, shrugging his fat shoulders, and bent his head in thought. An instant later he looked up. "'You can't do it,' he informed the detective vehemently. "'You haven't got a shred of evidence against me. "'What's there? "'A pile of oranges and a peck of trash. "'What of it? "'Besides,' he threatened, "'if you pinch me, you'll have to take the girl in, too. "'I swear that whatever stealing was done, she did it. "'I'll not be trapped this way by her "'and let her off without a squeal. "'Take me. "'Take her. "'Do you hear?' "'I think,' put in the clear, bland accents of Brentwick, we can consider that matter settled. I have here, my man, nodding to the adventurer as he took up the black leather wallet, I have here a little matter which may clear up any lingering doubts as to your standing, which you may be disposed at present to entertain. He extracted a slip of cardboard and, at arm's length, laid it on the table edge beneath the adventurer's eyes. The latter, bewildered, bent over it for a moment, breathing heavily, then straightened back, shook himself, laughed shortly with a mirthless note, and faced the detective. "'It's come with you now, I guess,' he suggested very quietly. "'The barrister warrant is still out for you,' returned the man. "'That'll be enough to hold you on till extradition papers arrive from the States.' "'Oh, I'll waive those, and I won't give you any trouble either.' I reckon, mused the adventurer, jingling his manacles thoughtfully. I'm a back number anyway, when a half-grown girl, a half-baked boy, a flub like Mulready, damned his eyes, and a club-footed snipe from Scotland Yard can put it all over me this way, why, I guess it's up to me to go home and retire to my country place up the Hudson, he sighed wearily. Yep, time to cut it out. "'but I would like to be free long enough to get in one good lick at that mutt Mulready. "'My friend, you get your hands on him, and I'll squeal on him till I'm blue in the face. "'That's a promise.' "'You'll have the chance before long,' replied the detective. "'We received a telegram from the Amsterdam police late this afternoon, "'saying they'd picked up Mr. Mulready with a woman named Hallam, "'and were holding them on suspicion. "'It seems—' turning to Brentwick, they were opening negotiations for the sale of a lot of stones, and seemed in such a precious hurry that the diamond merchant's suspicions were roused. We're sending over for them, Miss Calendar, so you can make your mind easy about your jewels. You'll have them back in a few days. Thank you, said the girl, with an effort. Well, the adventurer delivered his peroration. I certainly am blame glad to hear it. "'Twouldn't have been a square deal any other way.' He paused, looking his erstwhile dupes over with a melancholy eye. Then, with an uncertain nod, comprehending the girl, Kirkwood, and Brentwick, "'So long,' he said thickly, and turned, with the detective's hand under his arm, and, accompanied by the thoroughly cowed striker, waddled out of the room." 
End of chapter 19, part 2. Recording by William Tomko. Chapter 19, Part 3 of The Black Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. The Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance. Chapter 19, Part 3 The Journey's End. Kirkwood, following the exodus, closed the door with elaborate care and slowly, deep in thought, returned to the table. Dorothy seemed not to have moved, save to place her elbows on the marble slab and rest her cheeks between hands that remained clenched, as they had been in the greatest stress of her emotion. The color had returned to her face, with a slightly enhanced depth of hue to the credit of her excitement. Her cheeks were hot her eyes star-like beneath the woven, massy sunlight of her hair. Temporarily unconscious of her surroundings, she stared steadfastly before her, thoughts astray in the iridescent glamour of the dreams that were to come. Brentwick had slipped down in his chair, resting his silvered head upon its back, and was smiling serenely up at the low yellow ceiling. Before him on the table, his long white fingers were drumming an inaudible tune. Presently rousing, he caught Kirkwood's eye and smiled sheepishly, like a child caught in innocent mischief. The younger man grinned broadly. "'And you were responsible for all that,' he commented, infinitely amused. Brentwick nodded, twinkling self-satisfaction. "'I contrived it all,' he said. "'Neat, I call it, too.' His old eyes brightened with reminiscent enjoyment. "'Inspiration,' he crowed softly. "'Inspiration, pure and simple. "'I'd been worrying my wits for fully five minutes before Watton had it. "'I talked with Charles by telephone. "'His name is really Charles, by the by. "'Overcame his conscientious scruples about playing his fish "'when they were ready all but landed, and settled the artistic details.' "'He chuckled delightedly. "'It's the instinct,' he declared emphatically, "'the instinct for adventure. "'I knew it was in me.' latent somewhere, but never till this day did it get the opportunity to assert itself. A born adventurer, that's what I am. You see, it was essential that they should believe we were frightened and running from them. That way they would be sure to run after us. Why, we might have baited a dozen traps and failed to lure them into my house, after that stout scoundrel knew you'd had the chance to tell me the whole yarn. Odd. "'Weren't you taking chances, you and Charles?' asked Kirkwood curiously. "'Precious few. There was another motor from Scotland Yard trailing Captain Strikers. If they had run past, or turned aside, they would have been overhauled in short order.' He relapsed into his whimsical reverie. The wistful look returned to his eyes, replacing the glow of triumph and pleasure. And he sighed a little regretfully. "'What I don't understand,' contended Kirkwood, is how you convinced Callender that he couldn't get revenge by pressing his charge against Miss Callender, Dorothy. Oh? Mr. Brentwick elevated his fine white eyebrows and sat up briskly. My dear boy, that was the most delectable dish on the entire menu. I have been reserving it, I don't mind owning, that I might better enjoy the full relish of it. I may answer you best, perhaps, by asking you scan what I offer to the fat scoundrel's respectful consideration, my dear sir. He leveled a forefinger at the card. At first glance, it conveyed nothing to the younger man's benighted intelligence. He puzzled over it, twisting his brows out of alignment. An ordinary oblong slip of thin white cardboard, it was engraved in fine script as follows. Mr. George Burgoyne Calendar. 81 Aspen Villas, S.W. Oh! exclaimed Kirkwood at length, standing up, his face bright with understanding. You! I! laconically assented the elder man. Impulsively, Kirkwood leaned across the table. Dorothy, he said tenderly, and when the girl's happy eyes met his, quietly drew her attention to the card. Then he rose hastily and went over to stand by the window, staring mistily into the blank face of night beyond its unseen panes. 
Behind him there was a confusion of little noises. The sound of a chair pushed hurriedly aside. A rustle of skirts. A happy sob or two. Low voices intermingling. Sighs. Out of it finally came his father's accents. "'There, there, my dear, my dearest dear,' protested the old gentleman. "'Positively I don't deserve a tithe of this. I—' The young old voice quavered and broke in a happy laugh. "'You must understand,' he continued more soberly, "'that no consideration of any sort is due me. "'When we married, I was too old for your mother, child. "'We both knew it, both believed it would never matter. "'But it did. "'By her wish, I went back to America. "'We were to see what separation would do "'to heal the wounds dissension had caused. "'It was a very foolish experiment. "'Your mother died before I could return.' There fell a silence, again broken by the father. After that, I was in no haste to return. But some years ago, I came to London to live. I communicated with the old colonel, asking permission to see you. It was refused in a manner which precluded the subject being reopened by me. I was informed that if I persisted in attempting to see you, you would be disinherited. He was very angry with me justly, I admit. One must grow old before one can see how unforgivably one was wrong in youth. So I settled down to a quiet old age, determined not to disturb you in your happiness. Ah, Kirkwood! The old gentleman was standing, his arm around his daughter's shoulders, when Kirkwood turned. Come here, Philip. I'm explaining to Dorothy, but you should hear. The evening I called on you, dear boy, at the Pless, returning home, I received a message from my solicitors, whom I had instructed to keep an eye on Dorothy's welfare. They informed me that she had disappeared. Naturally, I cancelled my plans to go to Munich, and stayed, employing detectives. One of the first things they discovered was that Dorothy had run off with an elderly person calling himself George Burgoyne Callender, the name I had discarded when I found that to acknowledge me would imperil my daughter's fortune. The investigations went deeper. Charles, let us continue to call him, had been to see me only this afternoon, to inform me of the plot they had discovered. This Hallam woman and her son, it seems, that they were legitimately in the line of inheritance. Dorothy out of the way. But the woman was, uh, a bad lot. Somehow she got into communication with this fat rogue, and together they plotted it out. Charles doesn't believe that the Hallam woman expected to enjoy the Burgoyne estates for very many days. Her plan was to step in when Dorothy stepped out, gather up what she could, realize on it, and decamp. That is why there was so much excitement about the jewels. Naturally, the most valuable item on her list, the most easy to convert into cash. The man Mulready we do not place. He seems to have been a shady character the fat rogue picked up somewhere. The latter's ordinary line of business was diamond smuggling, though he would condescend to almost anything in order to turn a dishonest penny. That seems to exhaust the subject. But one word more. Dorothy, I am old enough and have suffered enough to know the wisdom of seizing one's happiness when one may. My dear, a little while ago you did a very brave deed. Under fire you said a most courageous, womanly, creditable thing. And Philip's rejoinder was only second in nobility to yours. I do hope to goodness that you two blessed youngsters won't let any addle-pated scruples stand between yourselves and the prize of romance, your inalienable inheritance. Abruptly, Brentwick, who was no longer Brentwick, but the actual calendar released the girl from his embrace and hopped nimbly toward the door. "'Really, I must see about that petrol,' he cried. "'While it's perfectly true that Charles lied about its running out, we must be getting on. I'll call you when we're ready to start.' And the door crashed, too, behind him. Between them was the table. Beyond it the girl stood with head erect, dim tears glimmering on the lashes of those eyes with which she met Philip's steady gaze so fearlessly. Singing about them, the silence deepened. Fascinated, though his heart was faint with longing, Kirkwood faltered on the threshold of his kingdom. "'Dorothy, you did mean it, dear?' She laughed, a little, low, sobbing laugh that had its source deep in the hidden sanctuary of her heart, of a child. 
I meant it, my dearest. If you'll have a girl so bold and forward, who can't wait till she's asked, but throws herself into the arms of the man she loves, Philip, I meant it. Every word. And as he went to her swiftly, round the table, she turned to meet him, arms uplifted, her scarlet lips a-tremble, the brown and bewitching lashes drooping over her wondrously lighted eyes. After a time, Philip Kirkwood laughed aloud. And there was that quality in the ring of his laughter that caused the shade of care, which had for the past ten minutes been uneasily luffing and filling in the offing, and, on the whole, steadily diminishing and becoming more pale and wan and emaciated and indistinct. There was that in the laughter of Philip Kirkwood, I say, which caused the shade of care to utter a hollow croak of despair as incontinently it vanished out of his life. End of chapter 19, part 3. Recording by William Tomko. End of the Black Bag by Louis Joseph Vance.